dead. Man talking. Tonight's story, I am very pleased to announce, is another wonderful creation by the wonderful mind of Head of Spectre. Over on Reddit, no sleep. Let me know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and that community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Untitled. The Last Ride of Roy Wilson Part 1 Let's get straight into that. Journal of Roy Wilson June 6th, 1887 Had I never again set eyes upon Marshal Harrison Cooper, it would have been far too soon, though I cannot rightly claim to have ever hated the man. For indeed all that I had was on account of his mercy. I had hoped that when we last had parted, we would never cross paths again. Perhaps had fate been kinder, our reunion may have been a peaceful one. A chance encounter that brought with it no ghosts of the past. However, I learned long ago that fate is not kind, it is cruel and spiteful. And that I ever forgot, the simple truth of that is solely on myself. In my youth, I saw the world as something I could take for myself. I was a fool, a stupid boy with a gun and a steady hand. And that was why I joined up with the likes of Blake Hayes. And Blake saw himself as some guerrilla in war that had never quite ended. He had been a confederate man a few years back and most of those who followed him had served with him back in the day. Blake with the sort who talked of freedom. He saw himself as a folk hero when I was young and stupid enough to buy into his bullshit. For five good years, he gave me what I wanted. Freedom. For five years, I lived outside the law, thinking that I was invincible. But looking back now, I can say that it felt like 50, and I was sure it was never going to end. Until... Did. We'd hit a bank in some small, nowhere town. It was supposed to be easy money. Nothing we hadn't done a thousand times before. The hit score itself didn't go bad at all. Hell, if it hadn't been for one little hitch, that life would never have ended as it did. But life's full of little hitches, ain't it? Little accidents that can change everything in the blink of an eye. I still don't quite know what happened. One minute I was on my horse, right behind Blake and some of the other boys. The next, I was in the dirt, herding all over. My horse was still running, but I wasn't. My shoulder was bleeding, coming up on me with the folks, my associates, and I had just finished robbing. That was how Marshall Cooper found me, locked up in the jail of some shithole town, waiting on a trial that would almost certainly send me to the noose. I would have done anything to avoid that, and I reckon that Cooper knew that. He cut me a deal, my life for the Blakes and his men. The choice was obvious. I led Cooper and a posse of lawmen to where I knew the boys had gone to lay low. Hell, I put a bullet in few of my former friends myself. I ain't never been proud of turning traitor, but I know that had positions been reversed, Blake would have sold me out just as quickly. Besides, that feeling of invincibility was gone. Having seen the inside of a cell and heard folks talk about stringing me up, that life outside the law didn't look so good anymore. Just about anyone who I'd run with had either died when the law came for them, or were sentenced to die when they had been brought in. It was as close to a clean slate as I was likely to get. And I took it. I never looked back. For what little it's worth, Cooper had the good sense to find me out in the wilderness, away from any who might overhear the business we had to attend to. This morning, I had set out to hunt for elk. 
I had tracked a small group of them, split off from the rest of the herd. My intent was only to kill one. For the sake of meat, and indeed I had chosen my target, and had it well within my sights, as I lined up my shot. I strode through the brush, head high and proud. It stopped briefly to nip at the ground, leaving only its antlers visible. And once his head was up, I had my shot and I took it. My aim was true. The gunshot rang out through the mountains, startling the other elk in the group. They ran, and mine could not. It fell and hit the ground hard. I rose from my spot amongst the brush and started towards the dead beast. From a distance, I could see its chest rising and falling violently as it tried to cling to life. And by the time I reached it, its breathing had slowed. One eye was fixed on me as I took out my knife. Its hooves moved as it wanted to run, but that elk was all but dead. I cut its throat to help it along and then started on taking it apart. And that's that was the point when I realized I wasn't alone. When I heard movements in the brush behind me, I went for my rifle. I was greeted by the last face I wanted to see. Harrison Cooper. The ten years since I'd seen him had been kind. Pretty as a picture he was. Blonde hair and a heavy jawline. Like a cowboy you might see in some dime book. Well, hello to you too, Roy. He said as if we'd last seen each other, only yesterday. Marshal, I replied, lowering my rifle. And Cooper wasn't the sort of man to kill a man in cold blood, but I wasn't fixing to provoke him either. Uh, you're awful far from San Antonio, ain't you? Yeah, afraid I am, he replied. Uh, you're looking good, Roy, making an honest living, I hear. I am, and I've done so ever since you and I concluded our past business with Blake Hayes, and I spat in the dirt. And I heard that too, the marshal said. Uh, you can relax, Roy. I ain't here for you. Then what are you here for? I don't suppose you went and got lost now, did you? I'm afraid not, he said. The smile he gave almost looked apologetic, almost. He dismounted his horse and approached my kill. He looked down at the elk before huffing. I suppose I'll help you get this back to your place. Maybe you and I might have a chat on the way there. I took him on that offer, and it might have been the dumbest thing that I ever did. I don't suppose you remember a fellow by the name of Jones? Daniel Jones? He asked as we rode back through the brush. Cooper rode beside me, leaving me uneasy. All the same, I answered his question. Jonesy, I remember him. One of Blake's crew. Crazy as a shit house rat, if I recall. I would have figured he would have hung with Blake. Now, if it had been that simple, I wouldn't have stopped by to visit, Cooper replied. That yellow bastard got out before the hanging, ran off into the wild. Last I heard, he headed northeast, up around Massachusetts. If he was still up in Massachusetts, he wouldn't be here. And Cooper laughed. No, nope, I suppose not, he said. There was an unusual incident about two weeks back. A train robbery, to put it simply. I've got a few folks that named Jones as the one behind it. What exactly do you mean, unusual? I asked. Ah, there were about 76 souls on that train. Every single one of them was alive when their train made it into the station. Only three of them have said anything about the robbery. The rest don't talk no more. Not a single word. The ones who are still alive are dead silent and pale as the grave. I thought you said they were all alive, I said. Well, they were when the train came in. Over the next few days, though, 30 of them just dropped. Not quite sure why. I heard people whispering of plague, but I ain't quite sure I buy that. Just what else may be. I can't tell you, but I got a feeling in my gut that Jones, or well, he's responsible. 
and I rode in silence, letting all that Cooper had said sink in, before shaking my head. Well there, Marshal. Looks to me like you've got quite a vexing situation on your hands. I don't think your man is old Jonesy, though. If that old son of a bitch had the brains to plan a train heist, I would be well and truly surprised. I could see Cooper's expression darken from the corner of my eye. Well, Daniel Jones is the only name I've got. If he wasn't the one behind it, I'm sure he was involved. You both ran with Blake back in the day. You might know where he's holed up. I ain't asking for much, Roy, but I ain't got no idea what I'm looking at right now, besides Jones and you're the only man I know who might help me find him. Well, there was a desperation in Cooper's voice that gave me pause. I noticed his friendly cowboy act drop, just for long enough for me to see that a man was genuinely unnerved. Something about that scent, a chill through me as well. I'm asking nicely, Roy, he said. I don't know if I've got any other options. Up ahead, I could see my cabin. I stopped my horse and stared at it in silence. I ain't a man I used to be, Cooper, I said. That man you cut a deal with ten years back, the one who helped you take down Blake, well, that was an outlaw with nothing else to lose, looking for a way out. Back then, I would have been all right going down, trying to take out Blake. I ain't the same now. I'm a hunter now. I got a wife and a boy. If I don't come home. Cooper was silent. He stared at the cabin alongside me. I ain't asking you to fight him, he finally said. Just help me find him and I promise you, you'll come home in one piece. You're asking me to trust that shiny badge on your chest, Cooper. I'm asking you to trust a man who kept you from the noose. Hmm, that had a little more weight to it. I didn't like it, but Cooper had a point I couldn't deny. Without him, I'd have been judged a sinner before the Lord and my bones would have been resting in the dirt. His reassurance wasn't much, but I suppose it might have been enough. Oh, I'd tell to Sarah. I'll have her set up a place for you to sleep and put out some grain for your horse. We'll leave tomorrow. At first light, I said. Well, I'd like a word with whoever named Jonesy. I want to be damn sure it's him before we start poking around old hideouts. And Cooper's eyes, they lit up with a more familiar smile. So, you're in? Well, if it's Jonesy, then yeah, I'm in. Otherwise, you're on your own. I warned before I nudged my horse homeward. That answer seemed good enough for Cooper. I don't look forward to riding out with him. I pray I'm wasting my time, but my gut tells me I'm not. Cooper ain't the sort of man to ride up into Guadalupe Mountains on a whim. If he wasn't so damn sure it was Jonesy, then he wouldn't have come to me. I know that old Jonesy ain't gonna be too happy to see me. Most of me ain't too happy at the prospect of seeing him either. But if I didn't confess that some part of me wouldn't relish watching him hang, I'd be a liar. That there's still a piece of my old life that ain't dead and buried and doesn't sit right with me. I wouldn't mind ratifying that. June 10th, 1887 It had been a long time since I'd left the mountains. San Antonio seemed a million miles away, and the ride was long. To say I enjoyed none of it, though, it would make me a liar. There's a thrill I had, long since forgotten, about being on the road. Something about the emptiness in the desert. It calls to a man, beckons to him. For just a moment, I remember that sense of the world belonging to me. It had been a long time since I'd felt that. If nothing else, it was good to feel it again. But for the first day or so, I couldn't help but glance back at the distant shape of the mountains, growing further and further away from me. My Sarah. My son, Jack. She had told me she'd manage without me for a few weeks. I knew she would. But my boyish excitement for the open road ahead wasn't enough to crush my doting worries. Cooper saw fit to tease me as we left the mountains. 
You know, I never would have pegged you the time to get homesick, Roy, he said as we rode. I shot him an evil eye for that. I'm used to keeping to myself, I said. I wasn't too sure if the world had a place for my sort. Not many folks out there on the mountains. Well, it's quite peaceful. Your family doesn't mind living that far away from the rest of the world. Sarah knows what I am and Jack don't know nothing else. They manage, I said. We ain't completely alone. There's a small town a few miles west. They pay for fur and meat. It's an honest living. And Cooper laughed, but I sensed no offense intended. Shit, Roy. You really have straightened out. I gotta say, I'm glad to see it. Uh, what about you, Marshal? Anyone waiting for you? For just a moment, I could have sworn the humor had left him. His smile came back as quickly as it had left, albeit somewhat less genuine. I tried marriage. Ain't for me. I'm a hound dog. I like to chase. Uh, ended up in another woman's bed, did you? Now it was my turn to tease. Not exactly. She wanted a man at home with her. But that ain't where I belong. He patted his horse on the neck. But his eyes were straight ahead, looking at the horizon. Anyway, I meant no harm. I am happy for you. Truly, I am. Truth be told, I figured I'd be seeing you again much sooner and under less pleasant circumstances. Well, I'm happy to disappoint you. I replied, and Cooper laughed again, a little more humor in it this time. And I ain't never been so happy to be disappointed in my life. And for the next few days we rode together, making our way into San Antonio. It had been years since I set foot there, and riding into town felt like trespassing on holy ground. I kept waiting for eyes to shift towards me to see my soul laid bare. But no one looked my way. No one knew who I was. Why would they? The notion that they would was stupid and childish, but I could not quite shake it. And Cooper seemed more at ease beside me. I suppose he would have been. He wasn't a man with a burden. I thought I caught him watching me out the corner of my eye, but if he was, he never looked directly at me. And together, we just rode through town and up into the unassuming little inn on a corner called the Lucky Pearl. And the place was down near empty, save for a few drunkards at the bar wallowing in the bottle. They didn't pay us much mind as Cooper and I went inside. And he nodded at the bartender before gesturing for me to sit with him at the bar. Afternoon, Al, he said. Marshal, the barman replied. What can I get you to? Couple of beers. Let's start when no, we're here. I held the barman left us with a nod, and I gave Cooper the side eye. Starkman, I asked. That the one who named Jonesy? His brother, Cooper said. Vladimir Starkman. He's a doctor up from Wisconsin. Came running out as soon as he heard what happened to his kid, brother. He's been keeping an eye on him, helping me get information. The brother, Igor, ain't all there anymore. You'll see. The bartender returned with our beers and Cooper took a long pull on his. I could hear footsteps coming down the stairs behind us. I looked over my shoulder to see a well-dressed man approaching us. He was tall and almost too thin, and with dark hair and a thick, groomed moustache. I figured that was probably Starkman. And I was proven right when he took a seat beside Cooper. Marshal, he said with a nod. I expected his voice to have an accent. It didn't. Starkman's eyes focused on me for a moment, inquisitive. Ultimately, he kept his questions to himself and spoke to the bartender. Oh, a beer, please. Coming right up, Dr. Starkman. Cooper set his glass down and watched as the bartender left to fetch Starkman's drink. So, Doc, how's he got holding up? Ah, no more coherent than he was a week ago, Starkman said. I get more out of his drawings than I do the man himself. His attention shifted to me. I presume you're Roy Wilson. The same, I said and raised my glass in greeting. 
Marshall says you might be able to find the man my brothers drew. Can you? Well, show me the drawing and I'll tell you, I replied. Cooper didn't say nothing about no drawing, though. Uh, Igor hasn't spoken a word since the robbery, Cooper said. Man was an artist by trade, though. Whatever done mess with his head hasn't quite taken that from him yet. And God willing, he might soon make a full recovery. But for now, the best evidence I got, that is, why is Daniel Jones on that train is his drawing. Now I'm damn sure that is Jones. But you told me you wanted a word with whoever had named Jonesy. Well, this, this is the next best thing. And this drawing is your only evidence? I asked. No, but it's the most solid. A few of the more coherent folks who were on that train made me mention him. Well, you can talk to him if you like. Assuming they didn't skip town by now. I scoffed and down my beer. Well, let's see this drawing then. I said before getting up, and Cooper quickly emptied his glass before following me and leading me up the stairs. A drawing, I said. Shit, Marshal. You rode four days out to the Guadalupe Mountains over a goddamn drawing. I rode four days out to the Guadalupe Mountains for a man who might know where to find this son of a bitch, Cooper corrected. He stopped in front of an unlocked door and before opening it. You're the one who said you wanted to be sure. Well, I already am. So, go and take a look. But the conviction in his voice was hard to ignore. I traded a look with Marshall before I stepped inside that room. I don't know what I'd been expecting. Some frilly high society type, lounging on the bed, with his watercolors perhaps. That was what had come to mind when Cooper had said that Igor was an artist. What I hadn't been anticipating was the half-naked, unwashed wretch staring vacantly out of the dirty window. Nor had I expected the scattered papers on the bed and the floor. A quick look confirmed that they were indeed pencil drawings, although exactly what they were drawings of wasn't always clear. There were a few I recognised as landscapes, trees, grass, brush and mountains. There were portraits of folks. On the bed, I saw one of Cooper that might as well have been a photograph. Then there were the countless drawings that just seemed... odd. Most of them were of what looked to be some sort of horizon. Yet the sky looked to have been violently scribbled all over, as if it were nighttime, save for one blank space in the center of the sky. A great big cross, like an X stretching across the horizon. So big, it seemed to dominate the sky itself. There were countless variations of that same drawing, scattered amongst his more coherent work. And just what it meant, I couldn't quite say for sure. Yet the sight of it sent a cold chill through me. It seemed wrong, frightening even. I couldn't stop myself from looking at them. On the desk, Cooper said from behind me and told me away from my thoughts. I looked at the small wooden desk that Igor sat near and approached it. And sure enough, there was yet another pile of drawings. These looked to be at the inside of the train. There were folks standing over the passengers, guns drawn. Igor had perfectly captured the terrified expression of a woman in the midst of being robbed. He captured the little boy in her lap, crying and afraid. I pushed that picture aside to look at the next one. Like the last, it was also on a train. A man stood in the doorway, face cast in shadow and yet Igor had drawn features that I clearly recognised. My eyes narrowed as I moved to the next picture. That and the next couple after. It was of a man I hadn't seen since the day I'd been shut of my horse. Well, he drew those after I tried to question him, Cooper said. Just picked up his pencil and started drawing. Considering how the name Jonesy had already popped up, I just put two and two together. Well, I continued leafing through the drawings. There were more of the train robbery. I saw the shape of what I knew to be Jonesy standing in the aisle, gun drawn and staring at something, coming through the door of the carriage. It was a figure of some sort, but but I couldn't make out much, if anything, on them. 
Igor had scratched out their face so violently he tore through the paper. The hell happened to this one? I asked, looking over at Cooper. Ah, hell if I know. We got to that point and he just got agitated. Started breathing all heavy and whatnot. Like he was scared or something. You know anything about whoever else was on the train? I asked. Nope. Aside from Jonesy, I ain't got no other names. Far as I know, he was one of the ones calling the shots. We'll find him. We'll find the rest of them. I could see Starkman standing in the hall behind him, waiting for my verdict. I presume you're satisfied? Cooper asked. Yeah, close as I can be, I replied. Where exactly did the train get hit? Could help us narrow down some possible hideouts. Cooper took a folded map from his pocket and set it down on the desk. Train was coming down from Oklahoma City. Now, from what we know, they got hit southwest of Fort Worth. Just uh, around here. He gestured to a spot on the map, and I leaned in for a better look. I racked my brain to dig up those old memories from ten years past. I studied the names of the smaller towns on the map before, seeing one I recognized. Chestnut Springs. Back in the day, when I'd been running with Blake Hayes, we heard about some wealthy something or other headed down that way. Some cattle baron looking for land. We'd ambushed his coach just outside of Chestnut Springs. I remember that robbery had gone bad. The bastard had pulled a gun on Blake, and he didn't take kindly to that. The second he saw the iron in that poor bastard's hands, he blew him away and left him in the dirt. And then, when his widow raised a fuss, she joined him along with their driver. I still remember the pop of the gunshots and that uneasy silence as the wife's screams echoed through the night before fading into oblivion. Uh, Blake had a friend in the area, a fellow he'd served with during the war. He owned a ranch just a few miles northeast. We'd lay low there for a time until Blake decided it was safe enough to move on. There was no immediate sign of the ranch on that map, but I remembered the name. Stone Acres, I said. That's a little ranch outside of Chestnut Springs, owned by a fellow by the name of Dick Roberts. He served with Blake back in the day. I'm damn sure he served with Jonesy too. It's in that area. If I was Jonesy, that's, that's where I'd go. Stone Acres, Cooper repeated. Well, all right then. Anything else in that area? Not that I know of. Blake many stayed in a little further south, closer to the border. Even if he ain't there, Roberts might be able to tell us where he might be. That man wasn't no honest rancher ten years ago, and I'm willing to bet that that ain't changed. Safe bet, Cooper said as he folded up his map again. Don't suppose you could find your way back there, could you? Ah. <sighs> Get me to Chestnut Springs and I could, I said. I suppose we're riding tomorrow. Damn right we are. I don't suppose you boys could use another gun, could you? Starkman asked. His voice drew my attention. He'd been waiting patiently by the door, watching us in silence. You offering? Cooper asked. As a matter of fact, I am. What about your brother? Ah, uh, he doesn't need me standing over him. I can arrange for his care here and until I return. But if you're going after the folks who left Igor in this state, then I'm in. I can handle a gun and I know how to treat a gunshot wound. And Cooper chuckled, his boyish grin returning. Well then, Dr. Stockman, I must admit I like your spirit, he said. If you're obliged to join us, please. Feel free to do so. However, just know that I aim to take Daniel Jones and his men alive and see them hang in San Antonio. Well, that won't be a problem, will it? Whether he hangs or we shoot him, he'll find his way to hell one way or another, Stockman replied. He looked over at me and I offered no argument. Not a bad way of looking at it, Cooper said. Well then, gentlemen, I believe you had... I'll best get you resting. I'll make arrangements to get us to Chestnut Springs tomorrow. And with luck, we'll have Mr. Jones in the ground within a few days. 
just like old times, huh, Roy? Why well, didn't answer that thing. Cooper gave Starkman a playful pat on the shoulder before leaving. Starkman's eyes focused on me, intense and a tad on Nervin. You sure this Jones fellow is at that ranch? Well, I can't be completely sure, I said. But you're a man of science, right? Well, let's call it a hypothesis. Hypothesis? Starkman repeated, unamused. I suppose we'll see about that. Hmm, I suppose we will, indeed. We'll set out for Chestnut Springs soon. I don't much mind for lack of respite. I truly do hope we find Jonesy at that ranch, and if we do, if we bring him in, I might just stay and watch him hang. It wouldn't hurt to see the last link to my past die. If anything, I'd say I might just sleep a little better at night. June 11th, 1887 We departed from San Antonio by train after a moderate breakfast this morning. Cooper had said he wanted to waste a little time making it to Chestnut Springs as possible. The train ride into Fort Worth took about half of the day and we stopped only briefly there before making our way to Chestnut Springs. The ride was about three or four hours. The sun crept across the sky as Cooper Starkman and I drew closer to the town, and when we got there, we barely even stayed to rest before setting out for Stone Acres. I need my way back, all right. While my memory of the landscape was not perfect, it was good enough. The sun was getting low on the horizon, giving it the purple color of a bruise. I looked at the sky, and somewhere in the back of my mind, I remember those odd drawings in Igor Starkman's room. And just thinking of them made my head feel numb, like there was some distant droning, and I could feel my heart race with anxiety that seemed out of place. I chilled it up to anticipation. After all, Jonesy was not likely to go down easy. More than likely, if he was set at a ranch, this was going to end in a gunfire. Even if we caught him off guard, he'd look for a way to fight. Of that much, I was certain. When dusk was upon us as we reached the old ranch, we hadn't spoken much during the ride over. I suspected Cooper and Starkman had that same heavy sensation in their guts as I did. Cooper especially had to have expected the same resistance I'd expected. His Winchester was slung up and over his back and his characteristic boyish grin oh, it was absent. Starkman it was difficult to read already, and the stoniness in his face didn't make things much easier. Ah, we're getting real close, I said, breaking the heavy silence that had settled in between the three of us. I adjusted to a small cluster of trees nearby, and with a farmhouse just barely visible past them. I remember that place. Dick's Ranch wasn't too far. Perfect. We'll catch him at night time then. Cooper replied. It wasn't long after that that we spotted the distant shape of a building, a familiar ranch that had hardly changed in over a decade. Ah, there she is, I said under my breath and coaxed my horse to a stop. Lights are all out over there, Starkman noted. Looks to me like nobody's home. Ah, oh, they're sleeping, Cooper replied, and he rode on ahead closing the distance to the ranch. Either way, I aim to be sure. I followed him, and with Starkman at our rear. We moved slowly down the dirt road into the ranch, an unbecoming silence broken only by the sound of our own hoofbeats was what greeted us. No cattle, no sound at all. A ranch with no animals, Starkman murmured. Promising indeed. This place is abandoned, Marshal. Well, maybe they left us something good, Cooper replied. He reached the door and dismounted his horse. He took his Winchester and went to go and knock. And as he did, I dropped to the ground. Starkman just shook his head and stayed up on his horse. I'll check the barn, I said. See if there ain't anything worthwhile in there. And Cooper nodded before glancing over at Starkman. 
Go and keep him company, Doctor. You too holler, if you see anything. Without a word, Starkman dismounted his horse and followed me. Together, we rounded a ranch and headed for the barn. I drew my iron, just in case. My backup declined to do the same. You expecting some kind of fight? He asked, half mocking. There's nothing out here. You don't find that suspicious? I asked. Roberts was a son of a bitch, but he had a good thing going here. If there turns out to be absolutely nothing out here, I might find that a little strange, wouldn't you? Starkman's expression softened, just a bit. Look at this place, I said. Look at the paint on the walls, the windows. What do you see? Paint looks nice, no cracks in the windows. Hell, I can still smell the cattle. If this place is abandoned, it hasn't been for very long. From the corner of my eye, I saw Starkman finally drawing his own iron as we closed in on the barn. And it was as we got closer that the smell hit me. A stink that I knew all too well. Decay. Something was rotten in there. And judging by the look on Starkman's face, he recognized that stink as well. Jesus, the fuck is that? I muttered to myself. And Starkman, he had no reply, and yet I think I caught his step slowing just a bit. There was an unease in his eyes that matched my own. The stench was heavy, almost to the point of being overpowering. I had come across countless rotten carcasses in my time. Yet this, this seemed like so much more. And trying not to breathe, I pushed the barn door open and looked into the yawning darkness. The overpowering rush of that god-awful smell was powerful enough to make me wretch. Jesus Christ! Starkman growled. Well, I suppose we found the cattle then. I suppose we have, I replied. In the dark, I could see an immobile shape of some sort, but just what it was, I couldn't clearly make out. In the low light, I spotted the shape of a lamp hung on the wall and grabbed it. You got a light, Doctor? Starkman produced a match without comment and lit the lantern for me. I almost found myself wishing he hadn't, as the feeble orange light was cast over the inside of the barn. I felt something in my chest lurch. At last, we caught sight of the bodies that had produced that awful stench, although to give a name to what we saw wouldn't be easy. There were parts of it. I recognized this distinctly animal, cloven hooves bent at odd angles and jutting out of a mass of flesh that sat in the barn. Blood and pus seeped out from the stitched together hides that looked to be from horses or cows. The empty eyes of what was left of a horse head were fixated on me, reflecting the glow of my lantern. And yet that head seemed to only be most of the hide, which had been mounted onto some sort of mutilated bull skull. The horns jutted through the holes in the hide. An army of flies buzzed angrily around that horrific mass of flesh. It was as if some sick bastard had stitched together all that had been slaughtered on that ranch, and I couldn't bring myself to look at it for too long. Jesus Christ! I spat before turning away, and Starkman just continued to stare at that monstrosity. What the hell kind of person... Does a thing like this, he murmured. Jesus, there's a dog too, crucified, strung up from the ceiling. Well, I'd rather not see that if it's all the same to you, I replied. God damn it. Your friend Jonesy, I don't suppose this, this was his work. His work, I asked before struggling to laugh. My good sir. I am not aware of a single person on God's green earth capable of this. Ah, Jonesy was a crazy son of a bitch. That he was, but this? No, I don't believe that this was. And I was cut off by a loud exhale and a scrape of movement. And from the corner of my eye, 
I saw that twisted mass of flesh begin to move. The disjointed limbs seemed to stretch before finding purchase on the floor of the barn. The carcass seemed to pulsate as I heard it breathe. Never before had I felt my blood run cold, but in that moment, I did. Starkman stood beside me, frozen in a silent horror that matched my own as the mutilated thing before us began to stand. And several legs supported its weight, and amongst them I was sure I spotted human legs stitched to the body like the rest. The mutilated head, horsehide sewn onto a bull skull, lifted upwards on a skinless neck. The naked flesh seemed to strain just by lifting it. The creature exhaled and blood dribbled out of its bony nostrils. The eyes fixated on us, studying us as we remained rooted to the spot. Starkman was the first to move, hastily raising his own eye and squeezing off three shots. The creature only barely reacted, twitching as if annoyed. Its black eyes fixated on him before it let out a strained growl that sounded like countless creatures groaning in agony. And then, massive and spider-like, it began to move, with speed that should not have been possible for a creature of its bulk. It lunged for Starkman, lowering its head like a charging bull. He only barely stumbled out of the way before it reached him. In my panic, I'd forgotten the gun in my hand. My only instinct was to shoot, and that's, that's what I did. I squeezed off two shots towards that abomination, and I could see its skin splitting as it turned to look at me. Rotten entrails spilled out of its new wounds as it bellowed at me, and from the upper floor window of the house, I saw the flash of gunfire and briefly caught a glimpse of Cooper, poised in a window and unloading his Winchester on the damn thing and it hardly reacted at all. Its movements were sluggish and slow, and decaying meat trailed behind it as it moved. Its sights remained set on me before it charged once more, skittering like a massive bug. It slammed its head into the dirt where I had once been, and one of its horns snapped and flew off. Part of its skull was shattered, but the abomination did not relent. And waving its head, I could goddamn flail as it tried to pursue me again. I could hear the crack of Starkman's pistol and Cooper's rifle, and the thing paid them no mind. As it reared for another charge, I launched a lantern at it, and it shattered on the creature's body, and it went up like a candle. In one moment, it was an abhorrent shape in the darkness, but the next, it was a towering inferno of flame. A twisted abomination, screaming in the voices of a herd of cattle, screaming in the voices of dead horses, and I swear, in amongst those cries, I heard the screams of a man. I stumbled backwards, putting as much distance between myself and that flailing colossus of fire that struggled to pull itself out. I blindly thrashed and squirmed. Oily black smoke billowing off of its body, and then its weight gave out beneath it. I saw it fall, legs splayed and twisted. Its body seemed to collapse in on itself as it broke apart with one final dying scream that pierced my ears. And then all was silent once more. The Last Ride of Roy Wilson Part 2 Let's get straight into that. As the distorted colossus of animal flesh burned by the barn, Cooper emerged from the ranch, his Winchester still in hand. Christ's sake, what the hell was that thing? He demanded. His eyes were bright in the firelight, which chased away the darkness that enveloped us as night fell, and Starkman only continued to stare at the dead creature, as if he expected it to rise up again and keep on fighting. And truth be told, I wouldn't have been all that surprised if it had. Hell if I know, I replied. Even I could hear the uneasy tremble 
in my voice. Dead animals stitched together. Thought they were dead, anyway. Well, they look fucking dead now, Cooper said before spitting into the dirt. He glanced over at Starkman, who rolled a cigarette with a shaking hand and wiped the sweat off his brow. And for a moment, all of us were silent and watched that thing burn until we couldn't recognize what parts had belonged to what animals anymore. And Cooper shook his head again and took a step back towards the ranch. I could see a rush in his gait as if he aimed to get the hell away from that thing as soon as possible. I could hardly blame him. Roy, Doc, come on. Let's get us some goddamn answers, he growled. My eyes lingered on the burning carcass of that thing in the barn before I followed Cooper. And Starkman didn't move at all. The man seemed lost in his own little world. I let him be. Please tell me there ain't no more of those fucking things in the house. I said under my breath. No, but there's something else. He replied as he stepped through the door. The fire from outside lit up the small kitchen and cast an orange glow that allowed us to see clearly enough. The marshal led me upstairs and into the bedroom where I spotted the shape of a woman curled into a ball, almost hiding underneath one of those nearby beds. Cooper stayed outside the door, his gun still in hand, as if he was expecting trouble. Me on the other hand, I knew otherwise. Christ, is that Martha Roberts? I asked. I glanced at Cooper, but I couldn't read his face. Ah, you tell me, son, he replied. And slowly, I approached the woman under the bed, even in the long, flickering shadows cast from the fire outside. I recognized her, although only barely. She was real thin, pale, and sickly. She barely resembled the smiling, rosy-cheeked woman I'd met ten years back. Her eyes were sunken in. Her hair looked stringy and thin. But I still remembered her. Mother, I asked. She didn't move, didn't even acknowledge my voice. Martha, it's me, Roy. Roy Wilson. You remember me? And still no reply. Not even a shift of her head to let me know that she'd heard me. I just found her like that before I heard the shooting. Cooper said. Didn't have much time to talk to her. Didn't get anything anyway. I presume the two of you know each other? Yeah, she's Dick Roberts' wife, I replied. Jenny reached out to try and coax her upwards. She didn't put up any resistance, and I managed to get her into a sitting position. Her breathing was slow and steady, but her eyes seemed vacant. The stillness in her reminded me too much of Igor Starkman. Question is, where's Dick Roberts? Cooper said. He came up behind me and crouched down on my side. He put on that boyish smile of his and tried to speak to her. Are you all right, ma'am? You heard in any way? No response. Martha's eyes didn't so much as move to acknowledge him. Her head just slumped to the side, like a corpse. Her eyes were vacant and unfocused. If she weren't still sucking in air... I might have thought she really was dead. Ma'am, Cooper asked one last time, although I got the sense he'd already given up hope on her. Christ, same as the folks on the train, he muttered under his breath before standing up. Which means Jonesy was here, I added. Could be they left something behind, or we should poke around. Maybe we'll figure out where they're headed. And I could tell that Cooper was thinking the same thing. Hell, if we're lucky, your friend Dick is still here. Alive, preferably. Dick? A voice rasped from behind us. Both Cooper and I turned round to look at Martha. She stayed by the bed, slumped against it, but her eyes had finally focused on us. Dick? She repeated, and I returned to her side. Yeah, Martha. We're looking for Dick. Where's he at? Her eyes glazed over towards the window. She slowly lifted an arm and pointed towards it. I didn't need to go and look to know where she was pointing at. I could see the barn from where she stood, and the glow of the fire from the dead thing we'd found inside. Dick, she repeated. 
the hell is she on about? Cooper asked. He looked at Martha again. Where the hell is your husband, woman? And I just continued to stare out the window before looking back at Martha. I think that was her husband, Cooper. What? That thing in the yard? Christ's sake, boy. That thing wasn't even human. How the fuck was that Dick Roberts? I don't know, I replied plainly, before shaking my head. I figured it so long, as Martha was sort of talking, maybe I might get something resembling answers. Forget it. Martha, what about Daniel Jones? Jonesy, you see him come through here? Her eyes shifted to me. It took a moment, but I saw her head begin to nod. The movement was slow, but deliberate. Jonesy, she repeated. And her. Her? Cooper asked, his brow furrowed. Who the hell is she talking about, Roy? Beats me. Who do you mean by her, Martha? The woman seemed to curl up a little bit, as if she was expecting to be struck. She shook her head, a violent jerk in motion from side to side before she collapsed. Cooper got down to help her up again. Who was with Jonesy? Martha? I asked. I need to know. Who was with him? Her eyes burned into mine, wide and brimming with new tears. Huh? Martha croaked. Huh? Huh? Who? Cooper asked, trying to not raise his voice. He glanced from me back to Martha as she continued to mutter that same word over and over again. Huh? Huh? Her body went limp in Cooper's arms. Her words slurred as she twitched and convulsed. Her eyes seemed wild and stared blankly up at the ceiling. Shit, she's not right, Cooper cried. Doc, Starkman! He gently moved Martha into my arms before running for the window to call for Starkman. The woman just continued to twitch and babble, although, for just a second, her eyes met mine as she spoke her last word. Charlotte. She said it so clearly, and that word hit me like a cold exhale. And then, nothing. Her body went limp, and she was gone. I could hear Starkman's boots thudding against the floor out in the hall, and when he burst into the room, I laid Martha down so he could try and save her. I suspect I already knew that she was too far gone to save them. The last word hung in my mind, unwilling to leave. Shawl. Something about it sent a chill through me. I rubbed my temples and recalled the drawings in Igor's room. The strange horizons with the great cross left blank in the sky. Cooper put an arm around me and led me out of the room, and Starwin did his vain work. Christ, what a fucking mess, he murmured. He took off his hat and wiped at his brow before looking at me again. I don't figure you got any ideas of who her might be. No, I don't. Blake didn't run with no woman. Not while I was with him. He sure as hell didn't run with anyone who'd leave a person. Like that. Christ, he repeated. Hell, we'll search. See what we turn up. Yeah, we'll see, I said absently. I could hear Starkman's efforts to revive Martha in the next room, going silent. Marshal, I don't suppose you'd recognize the name Charles, would you? No. What's that got to do with anything? Martha said it when you went to Carl Starkman, right before she stopped breathing. Sounds like a name. Someone else in Jones's crew could even be our mysterious lady friend. I had never heard of anyone named Charles, I said. Well, you have now. I sent a line to some associates of mine back in San Antonio. Maybe if we're lucky, they'll recognize the name. Cooper said, I didn't feel so sure of that. Starkman stepped out of the bedroom, his face grim. His silence told us all we needed to know, and for a moment, the three of us shared that silence. We'll stand by searching the rooms, and we'll bury her before we go. Cooper finally said, 
But there was an exhaustion in his voice. Roy, check the barn. We know that's clear. Starkman, check downstairs. We'll check the cellar together. Starkman just gave a nod before turning to head back downstairs. I hesitated for just a moment before making my way down to the barn. And the sting from that rotten beast hadn't gone away quite yet. If anything, burning it had only made it stink worse. And what was left was no more than a pile of charred flesh that split and curled back, making the crude stitches that held it together popping. And I kept my distance as I returned to the barn, my iron in my hand, just in case there was anything else waiting for me in there. And the barn itself looked nothing special, aside from the mess of dried blood and buzzing flies. I might not have thought much of it at a glance. As I pressed on inside, the wooden floor creaked with every footstep. Looking up, I saw the crucified dog that Starkwin had mentioned. My stomach lurched a bit. It didn't seem right to see a kindly animal strung up like that. And the cross wasn't like a normal cross, though. No, this one was in the shape of an X, like the one St. Andrew died on. Somehow, I doubted that this had been a tribute to him. No, if anything, this, well, this seemed like something else. From the corner of my eye, I spotted a small desk sitting in one corner of the barn, along with a few papers strewn about the top of it. It wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. The light from the fire outside was enough for me to try and read those papers, but there wasn't much on them that I could clearly make out. Diagrams of animals, like what a butcher might use, mixed with a looping, effeminate script. The fragments that I read didn't make sense to me, and I didn't dwell on them long. I felt something metallic bump against my boot and looked down to see what it was. It was a metal ring, looped through a small cellar doorway on the floor. I hesitated for a moment before giving it a good couple of stomps with my heel. If there was anything down there, some noise might have woken it. I didn't hear anything. I reached down and opened the cellar door. There was a set of wooden stairs leading in what looked like a dirt hole, hastily dug out beneath the barn. No doubt it had been used in the past to store ill-gotten goods. And yet, judging by the pile of leavings and the dirty bedding in one corner, there had been a man down there not all that long ago. I spotted the glimmer of something shiny in amongst the bedding and reached down to pick it up. It looked to be a gold rosary with a rather ornate design. I backed out of the little hole under the barn to get a better look at it in the firelight. It might have been loot from the train robbery or an heirloom belonging to the fellow who'd been down in that little hole. I clutched it tight and made my way back to the house, hoping a cooper might know a thing or two about it. Cooper was downstairs, with Starkman when I got back to the house. They lit up a lamp and were at the kitchen table, fussing over Cooper's map and some charred pieces of paper. You two find something? I asked. In a fireplace, Cooper replied. A map of some sort from the looks of it. Starkman's trying to figure out what it shows. There wasn't anything to find upstairs and the cellars just got stores and rats. You find anything in the Barn? Few things, actually, I said and held up the rosary. And Starkman glanced at it from the corner of his eye before shooting upright a funny look in his eye. You found that in the barn? He asked. He outstretched a hand for it and I tossed it to him. Beneath the barn, there was a little dirt cellar. It looked to me like someone was being kept down there, up until recently. And Cooper's brow furrowed. Jesus. You find anything else? Starkman asked. Clothes? A letter? Anything? Not in the hole, I didn't. There were some awful queer papers on a butchery of animals. Didn't look like much else, though. I paused and studied the way that Starkman clutched the rosary tight. What is it to you? I asked. I know this rosary, Starkman said. I know the man who this belongs to. 
You said you found it in the barn. You mean that? Why in the hell would I lie about it? You swear to God you found this in the barn. Starkman roared, and Cooper raised an arm between us, and I caught myself shrinking back a step. Now just wait a minute, Doc. Calm down. Who did that rosary come from? Bishop John Strickland. Well, he's been a close friend of the Stockman family for many years. He and my father, they grew up together. They were like brothers. My father gave him this rosary, a gift for his enthronement. I'd know it anywhere. And he paused, taking a moment to compose himself. I could see his hands trembling as he swore and kicked at the wall. We had a mutual friend in San Antonio. Igor and I had gotten word from Strickland that his health had taken a turn for the worst. He left to say his goodbyes before it was too late. The only reason I was not on that train with him was the health of one of my own patients. And Cooper and I traded a glance. I don't know about you, but that seems a strange coincidence that the man who was likely in that cellar was a close friend of a man from that train robbery. I said quietly. A strange coincidence indeed, Cooper agreed. I reckon that Egon knew where to find Bishop Strickland, right? Of course he knew, Starkman replied harshly. Hell, he might have been one of the few people who did know. I think there's no need to pretend. We all haven't come to the very same conclusion. Our train robbery was no simple robbery. They were after Father Strickland, or at the very least, someone who knew where they might find him. Let's just take it back a step, Cooper said. Before we start jumping to conclusions here, let's look at the facts. Now, we're sure that this was Daniel Jones behind that robbery. And we're sure that not only was he here, but he had passed the Strickland in his custody. We are clear on that, right? Crystal, Starkman said through a frustrated excel. Right, so, before we lose our heads, let's start asking where we're headed for next. The obvious destination is wherever they marked on that map, correct? Correct. Correct. I could see some of the tension draining from Starkman's shoulders, and I approached the map on the table. I leaned over it and studied the crudely scribbled landmarks. I could see a river nearby, and checked the man Cooper had laid out for anything that matched. Starkman had probably already seen the same thing I'd seen, but as I followed the bends of the rivers, I wondered if perhaps he'd only looked at the rivers in Texas. So, we find out where they're headed, we find the bishop, and they all hang in San Antonio. Or we leave them in the dirt for the vultures, I added. The river on the map they burned, or that branches off the Rio Grande into Mexico. The hell it does, Cooper said as he leaned over my shoulder. He scanned the map and saw that I was right on the money. Well, shit. They're headed south of the border if they ain't already there, I said. Last I checked, your authority ends at the border, Marshal. More or less, Cooper said, looking none too happy about it. I need to send word to Virginia. Maybe then we might get a warrant to pursue. Which would take how long? Starkman demanded. Too damn long, Cooper replied. But that's the only avenue we got. The only avenue you've got, Starkman corrected. Not me. I have a friend in danger and a brother left scarred by these men. Marshal, I'll not sit idly by and wait for approval before I pursue. Chances are the bishop will be long dead, or worse, by the time you get word back from Virginia. Doc, if you're aiming to charge across the border by yourself, guns blazing, you got another thing coming, Cooper warned. Now, I admire your spirit, truly I do, but if Jones and his men don't kill you, you'll answer to the law in Mexico. They might end up dead anyway. If that's what it takes, I'll have no regrets, Starkman said. He glanced at me as if expecting me to chime in. 
I hardly can say I knew the man, and as sure as hell didn't know him well enough to die for him. But all the same, I caught myself sighing. <sighs> the doc is right, Cooper. If we wait on this, then we'll lose him, and we'll probably lose the bishop. And here I thought you didn't want to go chasing after Jones, Cooper said. Why the change of heart? Well, when I said that there weren't no hostages involved, I ain't exactly the same, but I don't think I'd sleep too well if I left a man of the cloth to his fate. And given what I've seen here already, I prefer not to think on just what that fate may be. I looked over at Starkman, who, for the first time since I'd met him, looked genuinely happy to hear my voice. So, if you're crossing the border, then I am too. Now, I understand that you've got rules you need to follow, so we'll go with or without you, Marshal. I'll think no less of you if you stay behind. Now, Cooper, look between the two of us, his usual boyish smile absent. And he was silent for a moment and leaned on the table as he thought things over. He glanced up at a window where the fire that consumed the carcass or whatever we killed still burned bright. You know, normally, I'd wish you too well and bury the girl, forget what I saw today and be on my way, he said as he stared through the window. But we ain't even been gone a day yet and my gut tells me that there ain't one thing normal about any of this. If I were a better man, I wouldn't place my money on this shit getting any less weird either. But I suppose that both of you know that already, don't you? He looked away from the window and shook his head. We bury the girl first and then we'll talk about Mexico, back at Chestnut Springs. I need a fucking drink. On that last part, all three of us agreed. When we left the ranch behind after we buried Martha Roberts, the fire had spread to the barn and I thought it wouldn't be long until it spread to the house as well. Perhaps that might have been for the best. Whatever twisted things were done on that land were probably best burned. And Starkman, Cooper, and I will catch a train at dawn for Del Rio. Then we will find our way across the border. There, we'll travel to the point on the burned map and see what awaits us. The whiskey of the saloon in Chestnut Springs has not removed my memories of that thing in the barn. I believe I shall see it again in my dreams, perhaps for the rest of my life. That much I could tolerate, and yet the thing that keeps me awake is the fear that what we killed at Stone Acres, whatever it was, was not the only one of its kind. June 15th, 1887 we crossed the border two days ago and found ourselves in the wilderness of Kohila. The journey was slow, almost grueling at times. We followed the river slowly, getting closer to the spot marked on the map. The ride itself had been unremarkable, but between the three of us we hardly spoke. I could see it in the eyes of Starkman and Cooper. They hadn't been sleeping any better than I had. Even during the nights I could hear them tossing and turning. I didn't need to ask why. We still saw it when we tried to sleep. The limbs of that abomination, horse and cattle legs twisted until they were spider-like. The swollen, lumbering carcass of dead flesh that seemed to rip itself apart with its very bulk. I still see the dead eyes of the horse's head, mounted clumsily over the skull of that bull. I still smell the stink of it. I knew they had shared the same fear as I did long before we made it to the town. It just wasn't until after we got there that we actually had a name for it. We saw the fog first, so thick and heavy you could barely see the horse in front of you. Maybe we should stop for a bit, I heard Cooper call. Can't see shit in this and if we lose one of our horses. Terrain's level enough for now, Starkman replied. Don't see any reason not to keep going. I didn't weigh in. Unlike them, I saw the faded lights just ahead of us and kept my horse moving in that direction. Roy, I heard Cooper call, followed by silence. I knew he'd seen what I'd seen, and I suspected he knew what it must have meant too. Whatever we were looking for 
out there. We just found it. What the hell is this? Cooper asked. A town of some sort? <laughs> Maybe at one point, I said. I glanced at the old house that looked to be in the midst of collapsing. Not anymore. I stopped my horse and glanced behind me to make sure Starwin and Cooper were still close behind. They were. I dropped off, reaching for my iron and moving deeper into the fog. The hell are you doing? Cooper demanded. Shh, we'll be quieter on foot, I replied. In the fog behind me, I saw Cooper starting to dismount his horse. Thankfully, the man had seen my point. I figured Starkwin was likely right behind him. And I moved deeper into the abandoned town. And there was no sound, no birds, nothing at all. The silence was deafening. The hell happened here? I heard Starkman murmur. Place feels like a goddamn graveyard. Could be Jonesy and his friends have already moved on, Cooper said. God damn, if we've missed them. Hello? A voice called out through the fog in front of us, and the three of us froze. Cooper went for his six gun and aimed it into the blank white ahead. It took me a few seconds to see what he saw. The shape of a man coming closer through the fog. The shape stopped, dead, in its tracks. Hector, that you? Guess I spoke too soon, Cooper murmured, and thought for a moment before calling out. It's Hector, and both Starkman and I glanced at him, no doubt wondering what the hell he was thinking, when a voice replied. The hell are you doing out there in the mist, Hector? Come on back! Well, evidently, we were dealing with some sort of moron. And with his gun still drawn, Cooper walked towards the stranger in the mist, as if there wasn't a problem in the world. The poor dumb fool probably couldn't get a clear look at his face in the fog, and by the time he did, he didn't even get to let off a scream before Cooper had knocked him into the dirt. And Starkman and I flanked him as Cooper dragged our new dumb friend through the dirt and slammed him up against the ruins of a building. My new friend was just a boy, no older than sixteen, and with bright red hair and eyes wild like a gutted deer. And Cooper kept a hand over his mouth and put the barrel of his gun up against the bottom of his jaw. You scream and I'll blow your head clean off, boy, he warned. Do I make myself explicitly clear? And the boy tried to nod and Cooper slammed him against the wall. I said, am I clear? And this time, the boy had made a little more effort, and Cooper took his hand away. Daniel Jones, where is he? He growled. Ch Church, him and Kennard, the boy stammered. Kennard, Cooper asked. That's the woman's name? Y yeah, Kennard, Primrose Kennard. Jonesy brought her down from somewhere. Uh, Mississippi, uh, Missouri, I, I don't remember. And Cooper studied the boy for a moment before forcibly turning him around. Right, get some rope from my horse and help me truss up this little shit. And I got up to head back to the horses when I heard another voice from the frog, from the direction we'd come from. Henry, you there? Hector! The boy tried to scream but Cooper covered his mouth again. Get rid of that one, quiet. He whispered to me. I gave a half nod before pulling my hunting knife from my belt. I could see the shape of a man approaching our horses. I was sure he had a gun drawn, and so ducked behind one of the old houses and circled around it. Henry? Hector called again, just as I had rounded a house and came out right behind him. If he had heard me coming, he didn't have time to stop me before I was behind him and with my knife in his throat. The moment happened quickly. One minute I was behind him and he was alive, the next he was bleeding out in my arms. No different than the animals I had hunted. I had killed a man before, but it had been so long that I couldn't help but pause as I ended the stranger's life. I had felt odd, wrong, but the deed I was done. I let the body drop 
and Hector hit the ground like a sack of potatoes, choking on his own blood as he did. I tried not to dwell on that. I backed up towards Cooper's horse and grabbed the rope. The boy, Henry I suppose his name was, was dead still by the time I returned to him and Cooper. No doubt he'd seen me waste his friend. You count yourself lucky. I'm a Southie kid, Cooper said as he bound his wrists. Now, if you be so obliged, where's the church? Up, up the road. J just up the road. You can't miss it, mister. The boy stammered. P please, I, I don't want to die. And Cooper just cracked a smile. Well, I ain't really got room for prisoners. Good hell, if I'm just going to kill some kid whose bars ain't even dropped yet. Oh no, you're coming back to Texas with us. And with that, he rammed a rag into Henry's mouth and left him on the ground. Starkman regarded him quietly before heading up the road through the fog and towards the church. Now we heard voices as we got closer, a man's distant screams. I could see Starkman picking up his pace and knew he recognized that voice. And through the fog, I could see the church. It was old, its paint was chipped and worn. We had seen better days, but it was still intact. And Cooper raced past me and put a firm hand on Starkman's shoulder as he neared the door, pulling him back. He glanced back at Marshall with a rage in his eyes, although he relented quickly. Look first. Shoot second, Cooper whispered. He gestured to the door and we quietly drew nearer. And the doors were open, just enough for us to see inside as we got closer. And I heard a woman's voice speaking. Be on it, your excellency. Very few are given a chance to serve the true gods. Your life is a servitude to a higher purpose. That, I promise you. The church was well lit with oil lamps along the walls. I peered through the broken door and spotted a man, dressed in the dirty robes of a bishop, on his knees before the altar. No doubt this was Strickland. Just a few feet away from him, I spotted a figure I recognized as old Jonesy. He had grown huskier in the years since I'd last seen him, but I knew his face all too well. Yet the star of the show was a woman. Primrose Kennard, she had been called. I hadn't quite known what to expect, but she both lived up to and defied my expectations. She was tall and lovely with pitch black hair that fell to her shoulders. She had a slight baby face, yet that only seemed to add to her loveliness. She wore no guns, and yet something about her still sent a cold chill through me. In one hand, she carried a bone knife and held it to the bishop's throat. Don't be afraid, she crooned, cradling his face like a lover. I won't make you face it again. Her thumbs ran gently over his cheeks, and she smiled sweetly at him as she bent down to kiss his forehead. No, you're meant for the shawl, Bishop. You're here to show me the way and I saw the knife dip lower, moving towards the bishop's throat, and I knew that whatever she had been building up to, she was about to do it. You drop that knife, woman! I heard Starkman yell. He pushed past us and threw open the door, aiming his gun right at a woman's heart. Kennard pulled back, eyes wild in surprise at first, before her lips curled into a smile. Well, well, we have visitors! She crooned. Beside Starkman, Cooper and I entered the church as well. His gun was trained on Jones, as was mine, and Jones stood protectively before Starkman, and I felt his eyes on me. Roy Wilson, he said, his voice lower and gruffier than before. Well, I be. Is that you? Being too long, Jonesy, I replied coldly. I thought you hung ten years back. Almost, he replied. No thanks to you. You a marshal now? No, 
but I'll put you in the ground all the same. Jonesy's crooked smile widened, exposing yellow teeth. Good luck to you. He glanced back at Kennet, who still clutched her knife tightly, before going for his guns. I couldn't tell you who shot first. Myself, Cooper, or Starkman. What I know for sure is that we filled that son of a bitch with enough lead to kill him five times over. And he didn't so much as fucking flinch. Jonesy drew his iron as if we hadn't even shot at him. His first three shots struck the walls. I scrambled for cover behind a pew. And from the corner of my eye, I saw Cooper doing the same on the opposite side of the chapel. And Jonesy kept a gun aimed on each of us. Although when he saw Starkman try to make a run for the door to the altar, he forgot about us. He fired twice before Starkman dove low and Cooper took advantage of his lapse in judgment to take a shot at him. I saw his muzzle flash and I saw part of Jonesy's skull shatter. I swear I saw bits of his brain dribbling down the side of his head, but that bastard still stood tall shooting back like he had all day and laughing quietly all the while. And behind him, I watched as Kenneth seized the bishop by the hair. Starkman had tried to get up to make another run for him, but, but Jonesy, he just shot above his head as soon as he saw him trying to poke out. None of us could have saved Bishop Strickland, not even if we wanted to. Kenneth drew the knife finally across his throat, and damn near taken his head off. And then, with the bloody knife still in hand, she turned towards the altar, almost oblivious to the carnage behind her. Ancient guardian, I beg of thee, and with sacred blood on the sacred ground, I invoke thee. Grant me an audience in exchange for this holy life. And she drove the knife into the wooden altar, and I felt the ground itself quake. The world around us seemed to dim into a blackness, darker than even nighttime itself. And Jonesy paused, looking back with what was left of his skull, and Kennard who stood triumphantly before the altar. I saw my shot, and I took it. I had never killed a woman before, much less shot one in the back. But given her circumstances, I wouldn't have lost any sleep. I know my aim was true. The bullet should have hit her dead on. Instead, I felt a pain in my shoulder, like someone had just slugged me hard. And for the first couple of seconds, it hardly registered as painful. But then it started to burn. I saw a blood red stain blooming on my shoulder. The gun fell from my hand, and looking at Kennet, I saw her smiling at me. I knew that somehow she'd done this to me. And I collapsed back down behind the pew as a great shadow grew from the darkness before her. I clutched at my new bullet wound, trying as best I could to stop the bleeding. And Jonesy stood still in the aisle of the chapel, keeping close to Kennard and trading bullets with Cooper. And for a moment, I was sure that he had been the one who shot me, but I was sure he hadn't so much as looked my way when I shot at Kennard. And from the corner of my eye, I saw Starkman pop out from cover to take a few more shots at Jonesy. I can't say why he bothered bastard remained as unflinching as ever. Even with half his skull blown away, he hardly seemed to give a damn. He looked back towards Kennard and watched as the darkness before her grew larger. I saw a shape inside of it, something tall and looming. Its limbs seemed thin, like bones, but I could have sworn they had a texture like wood. I saw what looked to be a bare human skull looking down at her. Yet a pair of beady eyes looked deep within their sockets. The entity that had answered Kenneth's summon spoke in a deep, rumbling voice, although I couldn't make out the words over the gunfire. I saw Starkman calling behind the same pew Cooper was behind, having given up his mission to save the bishop. And blood dripped from a fresh gash in his temple where he'd been grazed. Not a bad effort, but y'all won't be killing me today, I heard Jonesy say, his voice thick and wet. Miss Ken has made some modifications. That's a speciality, you see. 
and I could hear his heavy footsteps drawing nearer to us. Maybe when I'm done with you boys, she might find something she can salvage. Eyes, guts, bones. <laughs> I suppose I, I suppose I could use a new skull. He chuckled deeply. And from behind his pew, Cooper glanced over at me and I saw real hopelessness in his eyes. We were cooked and we all knew it. Jonesy was just coming to finish the job. I spotted my gun on the floor near me and grabbed at it. I knew it was almost surely suicide, but I had one idea that might just work. I dove out from behind the pew and unloaded my pistol into Jonesy's legs. I aimed for the knee and I saw blood spatter against the pews. And just as I'd hoped, the bastard's newly busted legs couldn't support him. I saw the panic in his one good eye before he went down. He braced himself against the pews to try and avoid collapsing outright, and that gave us the window I needed. With my last shot, I took aim at one of the oil lamps on the walls. Fire had killed the thing at the ranch. Maybe it might kill Jonesy too. The least it could do was cover our escape. The flames erupted from the broken lamp, quickly catching on the old pews. That church was likely going to be an inferno in a few minutes, and I didn't want to stick around to see for sure. Move, I yelled before bolting towards the church door. Cooper and Stockman both took the hint, and they followed me to the door. Starkman paused for only a moment to take a parting shot at Jonesy's head, but I didn't get to see if it made any difference. Clutching my bleeding shoulder, I sprinted through the fog, almost falling over once or twice. I didn't stop until I saw the horses. Come on, move your asses, I yelled. Looking back again, I saw Starkman coming up behind me. And Cooper had stopped to grab that goddamn boy we'd left trussed up. If I had the time, I would have cursed him out for it. And with Starkman's help, I was able to get up on my horse. And through the fog, I could see the church burning, and yet I had a sick feeling in my stomach that our troubles were far from over. We hadn't won, we just hadn't died. The Last Ride of Roy Wilson Part 3. Let's get straight into that. June 17th, 1887 We camped for the night, without a fire, up a ways in a ridge where we had a half-decent vantage of the town. And through the fog, you could see the glow from the church fire pulsing like a beaten heart. Starkman had patched me up about as well as he could, but my new gunshot wound still hurt, something fierce. It was dawn when I finally woke again. The boy we'd taken from the town, Henry, was still trussed up and gagged, although even if he hadn't been, I doubted the little shit would have had the balls to run. And Starkman was fast asleep under a nearby tree while Cooper was keeping low in the brush, watching the dirt road we'd taken into town. He glanced back at me as I sat up and flexed my arm. It still hurt like a son of a bitch, but I could deal with the pain. How are you feeling, Roy? He asked. Like shit, I replied. I picked myself up and kept low as I joined him in the brush. It didn't take me long to see what he saw. Horses, about nine or ten of them, making their way back the way we'd come. Up in front, I spotted a pale, bony-looking thing that looked as if it had crawled out of a graveyard, and atop of it sat none other than Kennet herself. And riding up her flank was a mountain of a man that might have been Jonesy, although this fella still looked to have his whole head intact, as opposed to the broken fragments of bone we'd left him with. I opted not to think about that too much. Where do you think they're headed? I asked. Hell if I know. Back across the border, maybe. Mm, well, that's good, ain't it? Fixes our little issue with jurisdiction. Yeah, if they're actually going. 
after last night, I ain't so sure I'm willing to follow them anymore. He spit into the dirt and opened his flask of water for a drink. He offered me some as well. My throat was parched and I was happy for the drink. Are you talk to the boy at all? I asked as I returned his flask to him. Tried. He wasn't too chatty last night, but you're welcome to give it a shout if you feel so inclined. I just might, I said and stood up. And from the corner of my eye, I saw Starkman standing behind us. I hadn't heard him get up, but I knew he was watching Jones, Kennard, and their associates right off. And judging by the look on his face, he was none too happy about it. Those rotten little horse hunts. Marshal, you got a shot on them? Son, we blew Jones' head clean off last night, and he kept on shooting. I'm content to just observe right now if you don't mind, Cooper replied plainly. The hell you are. And Starkman went for his pistol and took aim at the distant horses. For a moment I was sure he was crazy enough to pull the trigger, but he just stood there aiming at those horses before he swore. The rage in his eyes didn't fade though. Instead, they turned on the boy. If Henry had been asleep when I had awoken, the commotion had since woken him up and he was greeted by a very angry Dr. Stockman coming at him with a six-gun in hand and a terrible bloodlust. You! The doc growled as he rolled the boy onto his back and jammed his pistol right up under his chin. You're gonna tell me where the hell your friends are riding to, or so help me God, you will shake hands with St. Peter today. I don't know, Henry squealed, sounding more like a pig and less like a man. I swear it, I swear I don't know. Then who does, Starkman growled. Cooper raced to his side to try and put a hand on his shoulder, but the good doctor just pushed him off and gave him a warning glance that made it clear he would not take kindly to an interruption. The marshal had a hand over his pistol, but he didn't draw. You people clearly have some other business to attend to. What was it? Starkman asked. c, -c kennard Henry stammered. She, she was looking for something. Some sort of ritual, I think. Said she had to kill the preacher to talk to the old fay and had to tell her what she needed. What ritual? Starkman snarled. I don't know. I swear. And Starkman kept a gun pressed under his chin as Henry whimpered like a kicked dog. I was almost sure he might shoot the poor bastard, but in time he hosted his peace. Kennard, was she the one who left that, that thing at Dick Roberts' place? And Henry tried to sit up, tears and snot running down his face. He managed to nod. She's... she's some sort of doctor. Not like any doctor I've ever heard of, though. A witch, more like. She, she does things, and... with anything dead. Cattle, horses, hell, or even people. Cuts them apart and sells them back together, but... not in the same way they were before. She was even doing it to Jonesy. Putting things in him and taking them out. Things? I asked. And Henry nodded. Y yeah, I, I saw her cut the heart right out of one of the cattle back at Dick's place. And then she cut open Josie and put it in. I seen her take bones, lungs, other things. Uh, Josie says she's making him stronger. I don't know about that. And Cooper and I traded a look. If we hadn't seen some of Kennard's work firsthand, I think we both would have thought him insane. And Starkman. On the other hand, just kept an intense eye on the boy. What was your business with Bishop Strickland? He asked. You said Kenneth killed him to try and talk to something. To ask it about this ritual. And again, Henry nodded. The girls in Del Rio said we needed a holy man. Not just a preacher. Someone higher up. We heard he was abroad, close to the border and... Seemed like easy pickings. Well, we looked for him. Uh, we found was a telegram sent from some foreign fellow. Uh, Igor something or other. Saying he was coming to visit. And I saw a flash of rage into Starkman's eyes. 
So you hit the train he was on? He said quietly, and Henry hesitated for a moment before nodding slowly. Starkman, relax. Let's back up a step. Cooper cut in. You mentioned some girls in Del Rio. What girls? Them. Awfully queer group they are. Like Kenneth. I can take it to them. They'll know a hell of a lot more than I do. Well now, son, that is music to my ears, Cooper replied, his smile returning for the first time since we crossed the border. Starwin glanced at Cooper before taking a step back away from Henry. He spat in the dirt beside him before heading down towards the horses. In the distance, Jones and Kennard were just specks who probably long since forgotten about us. They had other places to be as did we. The trip back across the border was a little nicer than the trip there. We caught Henry free but kept a close eye on him as we rode two days back to Del Rio. Our little visit on foreign soil had exhausted us, but we pushed on all the same. When I set foot in Del Rio again, I caught myself breathing easy for the first time since we'd left San Antonio. It was late when Henry led us to the bittersweet brew house, and I imagine that both the doctor and the marshal expected more than a glorified rundown whorehouse. It was a seedy little building, right by the water, that stank so strongly of alcohol, I could smell it from down the street. Cooper stopped dead in his tracks as he laid eyes upon the building, and then looked warily at Harry. Son, exactly what kind of girls are you taking us to see? Not the kind you think, Henry replied meekly. Jersey said that whatever you do, it's best not to look them in the eye. Oh, that's how they get you. Do they now? Starkman scoffed. He drew his eye in again. Boy, if I find out you're trying to trick us. Put that thing away, Doc, Cooper said. I think we've all seen enough of these past few days to have a little faith in our friend here. If it turns out he's leading us on, well, I may not notice if he were to get shot through some unknown means or fall into the river. But we won't know for sure until we see what's in the whorehouse. And Starkman scoffed and reluctantly holstered his gun again. But if mere looks could kill Henry, huh, he would have been dead as a doornail. And with his usual vibrant smile, Cooper gestured for Henry to lead us into the brothel which, for the most part, was no more pleasant inside than it was outside. The men in there were mostly older, haggard gentlemen who had not been treated kindly by life, and yet, the women. Well, I can't recall the last time I ever saw so many lovely ladies in one place. They looked young, and with flawless skin and charming smiles. And just looking at them, I almost forgot why I'd come in. Hell, I almost forgot about Sarah at home. And the hand on my shoulder pulled me back to reality. Don't look him in the eye, Henry said, his own eyes wide. Don't ever look him in the eye. Well, well, Henry Smith, is that you? A voice rang out behind him. Henry looked over his shoulder slowly to see one of those lovely ladies of the night sauntering towards him. And she had silky dark hair and sunk his skin, along with a coquettish grin, that made my heart throb. I caught Cooper eyeing her up beside me, and I could hardly blame the man. Hello, Michaela, Henry said quietly, voice shaking as if he were being approached by a hungry lion, and not a beautiful woman. Back in town so soon, and with new friends to boot. Couldn't stay away, could you? She asked. Her toothless grin widened, as she lovingly caressed his cheek and tried to coax him to look up at her. And to the boy's credit, he followed his own advice and did everything in his power not to look her in the eye. I I'm still with Primrose Kennard, he croaked. I and I'm under her protection. Kennard ain't here, darling, and your friend there is wearing a marshal's badge. I ain't a gambler, but looks to me like you turned traitor, naughty boy. But I suppose that means no one will miss you. Ma'am, I'm sorry to interrupt, Cooper began, but we were just looking to ask you a few questions. Rega 
Michaela's head turned towards Cooper. Shut up and sit down, cowboy, she said, and soon, as the words were out of her mouth, Cooper went dead silent. Obediently, he pulled up a chair and sat down quietly. Starkman took a step back from him before glancing at me, unnerved. You there, wild man, you stink like dead meat. If I had to guess, I'd say you're a hunter by trade. And you, Mr. Mustache, look like neither a lawman nor an outdoorsman. And judging by the smell of you and sling on Mr. Wildman here, I'll assume you're a doctor. Am I correct? Yes, ma'am, Starkman said quietly. You will either walk out of this establishment on your own two feet, or you will float on the bottom of the river until your gnawed, bloated carcasses wash up on the beach. Which you'll do depends on how I like your answer to my question. Which is, what are you doing in my fine establishment? It was at that point that from the corner of my eye, I saw one of the drunkards in the corner sitting with a whore. Only what I hadn't noticed before was the river of fresh blood running down his neck. I watched as the whore sunk her teeth into his wound and seemed to drink down mouthfuls of blood and I felt my stomach turn. And looking at Michaela in front of me, I could see a row of razor-sharp, shark-like teeth through her slightly parted lips, and I knew that whatever she was, she sure as hell wasn't a prostitute. I caught Stockman studying a pair of whores feeding off an old man near the back and knew he'd figured that out long before I had. Oh, we're looking for Primrose Kennard, I said quietly. Henry here tells us you might be able to tell us about the ritual she was asking about. The ritual? Michaela asked, before scoffing. She fixed her eyes on Henry. Get us a drink, would you kindly? Obediently, he shuffled off to fulfill her command and Michaela pulled out a chair beside Cooper. Sit down before I make you sit. And Starkman and I didn't need to be told twice. What's your interest in Kennet? she asked. I struggled to tear my eyes away from the whore, drinking the blood of the dying man in the corner before I managed to answer. Well, if you care to ask the marshal, he might tell you that she's wanted for the murder of Bishop John Strickland. I'm not asking the marshal, I'm asking you, Michaela said. You Egypt, sir, but where did you don't stand a chance in hell of arresting the likes of Kennet, right? Hell, if she's even still human, I'd be surprised. We're well aware, Starkman said. All the same, she killed a dear friend of mine and left my brother catatonic. We've also had the pleasure of seeing some of her work firsthand. Did you now? Michaela chuckled. And you're still alive. Well, good for you. I can only imagine what you've seen. Well, when she passed through, I heard her talking about all sorts of nasty beasts. The saw them might make my sisters and I look paltry in comparison. And what? What exactly are you? If you... I found myself asking as Henry returned to the table. He set our drinks down and stood at attention, with a vacant look on his face, waiting for his next order. Me? I'm a siren. Unlike Kenneth... I was born this way. I didn't need to work for my gifts, and from the sound of it, she certainly has been hard at work. If she's killed the bishop, I can't imagine it will be long before she's completed the ritual she was looking into, assuming she even survives it. And exactly what ritual was that? Starkman asked. It's complicated. I don't suppose either of you are familiar with Charles, are you? Shell, that name sent a shiver through me. Hmm, the name's popped up, I said, but I don't know what it means. Few do, Michaela said. Supposedly, before reality itself came into being, there was just nothing to say for Mother Void. Now, in due time, Mother Void gave birth to three children. First came Celia, the greater god of creation and well, obviously, they created. Next came 
Malibo, who became the guardian of all that is. And then finally came Shao, the destroyer. Now, according to old stories, they sort of just run the cycle of reality over and over again. Celia creates it, Malibo tends to it, and when the time comes, Shao destroys it. This is what always has happened. This is what always will happen. No changing it. Now. I've heard of plenty of people who have dealt with Malibo, but not a lot who have dealt with Shao. And guess which Camp Kennets falls into. Sure, I said quietly. Michaela nodded. Yep. Now, she didn't tell me all the details, only that she found a way to contact Shao and strike a bargain to gain power from it, which, if you ask me, is already plain with fire. What Kenneth was looking for when she came to me, though, was something a little, well, stronger. What do you mean, stronger? Starkman asked. There's rituals out there that not even the greater gods want folks to know about. Kenneth heard tales of one that would let her get a little more bang for her buck. Shao gave her a little sip of water, and now Kenneth wants the whole damn river. And I assume that's possible, I asked quietly. Michaela shrugged. If it is, I wouldn't know how to do it. No, but I'd be quite insane enough to try. But I told her who she could ask. I'll assume you boys aren't familiar with the old fae, correct? Not exactly, no, I said. They tend to know things, things that no one else does, and if you offer them something in return... They might just gift you with something good. And so we ask one of the old fae. Well, that's far easier said than done, wild man. They ain't easy to find, and there's always a catch. A trial. A sacrifice. They don't do handouts. The one Kenneth dealt with only comes when offered the blood of a holy man. And trust me, she picked the easy one. We're not murdering a man to speak to some monster. Starkman said, especially not another bishop. They can't just be the one nearby. There have to be others. There are, Michaela said. But as I said, this one won't ask for a lesser price. And she paused, thinking for a moment before she continued. There's a pond, not far from here. I can take you. But you best think well and hard before you go. This fay will want something personal, something you can't stand to lose. Whatever it is, I'll, I'll pay it gladly, Starkman said. Michaela just chuckled. <laughs> sure you will. That's all I got for you boys. If you're serious about meeting the old fay, come and meet me here by the river just before dawn. In the meanwhile, I don't give out information for free. And she stood up from her chair and patted Henry on the shoulder. He had barely moved since delivering the drinks we'd barely touched. I don't suppose you'll be needing him, will you? He's just what I need. He's heading back to San Antonio when we're done, I said. If it's payment you want, I've got... Take him, Starkwin said, cutting me off. And I stared at him in disbelief. Duck! We're not leaving this boy too. He ain't no different than the rest of those thugs riding with Jones. Let her have him, Starkman growled. He's a kid, damn it. We're not leaving him. Michaela just playfully shook her head, watching us bicker. She didn't see Cooper's gun raising out from under the table and pointing right between her eyes. The kid's coming with us, Cooper said calmly. I saw Michaela's brow furrowed in frustration. And notice a few of the other whores stopping their business to watch us. Cooper, put that goddamn gun down, I hissed, only to be ignored. The kid comes with us, Cooper repeated. Ma'am, if you try anything on me again, you will be dead before you hit the floor. You're a bold one, cowboy, Michaela said, her voice as level as Cooper's. How long have you been back in it? Long enough. I'll pay you whatever you want in cash right now. But the boy, well, he comes with us. 
For a few moments, that whole house felt awful quiet. Cooper kept his gun aimed at a woman's head, ready to splatter her brains all over the floor. It felt like years passed before at last she started to laugh. Ho ho ho, I like you cowboy, she said. I like you a lot. How about you pay for your drinks and get out? I'll just wait for Henry here next time he passes through. Oh, that sweet young blood won't go too far. Of that, I'm positively certain. She patted him playfully on the behind before turning away from us, still grinning like a wolf. Cooper lowered his gun and dropped it onto the table. For the first time, I noticed he looked downright scared. We didn't linger much longer. I'm sure I've left far more money on the table than we owed, but I'd have preferred to be safe rather than wake up with those horse teeth in my neck. We were barely down the street and with a dazed Henry in tow behind us when Cooper let loose on Starkman. He hit the dock with a slug out of nowhere, hard enough to drop him to the ground. The hell's wrong with you? He snapped at Starkman, laying in the mud. You were going to leave that boy to die? And then what? He's just another thug, Starkman hissed as he picked himself up. His hand moved back towards his gun, but Cooper, well, he drew first. He's a goddamn boy, Starkman. A dumb fucking boy. I'll give you that. But a boy are the same. I get that you're angry. I get it. But you don't decide who lives or dies. Says the man who happily sat by and watched Roy cut a man's throat back in Mexico. Starkman growled. Where exactly do you draw the line? I'll kill a man, Doc. Don't test me on that and you'll find out. But him? He gestured to Henry. What are you, boy? Fifteen? Sixteen? For, for fourteen, Henry stammered. He was still a little one of it, and stood stock still and pale. Fourteen? Jesus, Doc. You saw what them girls were doing in there. You were going to let them have a fourteen-year-old fucking boy? No, I was going to let them have some two-bit thug, Starkman corrected. Do you let every dumb kid you see get away, Marshal? Only the ones I know are making a mistake, Cooper replied. His eyes shifted over towards me before he put his gun away and offered a hand to help Starkman up. Don't make me repeat myself on this, Doc. A week clear? Well, the doctor hesitated for a moment before taking Cooper's hand. Crystal, he said, although I could tell he still wasn't all that happy about what had been said. Uh, we found a more reputable place to sleep for the night, although I can't say any of us managed to doze off. The images of rivers of blood trickling out of the necks of drunkards and past the ruby red lips of those sirens were still burned into my mind. Another horrible thing I could have lived my life without seeing, and I knew that it would only be a few hours until dawn when we'd need to see Michaela again. One thing I knew for sure was that if I never walked into Del Rio, Texas again, I would be far too soon. June 18th, 1887 Dawn quickly came, and none of us had slept too well. Either way, we rose early all the same. The ride back to the waterfront was a tense one. Starkman had a shiner blooming on his eye and refused to do so much as look at anyone else, and Henry just hung behind us, quiet like a limping dog. I couldn't blame him. The boy was probably too scared to speak a word to us. I would have been, for sure. We passed out front at a bittersweet brew house, which still stank of booze. At dawn, the place seemed quieter, although as we reached the shore, I couldn't help but crane my neck to watch the place. Near the back, I could see the shadows of two women carrying something out to the river. From the dark waters, a third figure emerged to take what the first two women had brought her, before carrying it down to the depths. I got a good enough look to know that what they were hiding in the river had likely once been a man. We stopped our horses by the river and waited, none of us quite sure exactly what to expect. We didn't wait for long, though. The sound of approaching hooves drew our eyes a little further down the river, 
away from the brew house, and we watched as a woman on a chestnut horse rode up towards us. At a glance, I hardly recognized Michaela outside of a saloon go get up. She donned a straw rancher's hat and a riding skirt, but her wolfish grin looked no different than before. Good morning, boys, she crooned as she drew nearer to us. Ma'am, Cooper said quietly. Last night, you mentioned you could take us to see one of the old fae. You meant that? So, you were listening, she teased. Oh, I'm a lot of things, cowboy, but I ain't a liar. I said I can take you to the old fae. I meant it. But we'll need to leave now. This one only ever shows at dawn, and so we best get moving. And with that, she trotted her horse past us and a little further down the river. We watched her for a moment before forming up behind her as she led us out of the town. I'm sure the idea that this was some sort of trick across their minds, but given our lack of other options, none of us spoke up about it. Up ahead, about a half an hour out of town, I could see a grove of trees and she was headed straight for it. At its edge, she dismounted her horse and tied it to the tree before fixing her hat. She waited for the rest of us to dismount as well. Stick behind me because this path is precise, Michaela said. You need to follow it exactly. Go where I go. Walk where I walk and whatever you do, don't get lost because if you do, there's not a thing in all creation that'll save you. If you're having second thoughts, I recommend you speak now, because once we start, we will not stop. You said this is the only way we can find out where Kennet went, Starkman said. You meant that? I did, she replied. Then we don't have a choice. Take us to the Fae. And Michaela's smile faded just for a moment before she turned and stared into the woods. And Starkman was the first to follow, with me, Cooper, and Henry Stane behind him. I hadn't imagined that little patch of woods would be all that thick, and yet as we followed Michaela, it just seemed to go deeper and deeper inside. And looking up, I saw that the sky above seemed darker than before, and the air seemed quite and heavy. No birds, no animals, nothing at all. Starkman kept his eyes ahead, following our fey guide through the twists and turns of the forest, but Cooper's eyes wandered. The trees seemed taller and thicker. It also looked dried out, as if they were dead. And from the corner of my eye, I could have sworn I saw a movement in the shadows. Shapes of things I couldn't quite name, climbing on trees as if they were trying to get a look at us. Her father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I heard Henry whispering, but his prayer sounded empty and echoed through the forest. Ah, prayers won't do you no good here, Henry, Michaela warned, her voice a cold whisper. Nothing here will hear them as anything more than a dinner bell, and the old guards of the forest don't listen to the begging of whelps. Henry's mumble prayer died in his throat and he stopped in his tracks for a moment before scrambling not to be left behind. Pale and luminous mushrooms dotted the forest floor ahead of us, offering the only light in that dark, otherworldly place we were in. Not even our own footsteps seemed to make a sound anymore, and for what felt like hours, all was silent, until at last we heard running water. The woods opened up into a clearing, it was dark as night. I could see the pond in the center of it, only because of the tranquil surface of the water reflected the little dots of light from countless glowing mushrooms like stars. It was as if someone had poured the night sky itself into a cup, although far more beautiful. Michaela lingered near the edge of the clearing, refusing to set foot any further in, and by the look on her face, I knew it was because even she feared what we were about to face. I had knows you here, she said. Go on, car to it and be respectful. And Starkman was the first to enter the clearing. He rounded the pond, staring down at it for a moment before looking around. He didn't see the water swelling as something deep within began to rise from the depths. Has the world fallen into such a state 
that the sisters of the Rio Grande do not even offer up greetings when leading strangers into our midst. A voice hissed, and Starkman turned to see what Cooper and I had already noticed. A shape emerged from the water. At a glance, I thought it was some sort of wolf or coyote, but it was far too large. Its dark fur was matted with moss and algae, and while the patches on its body, there was no fur, and looked like bulwood, and had a fiery glow to them, as if they were burning from inside out. I could have sworn I saw eyes blinking in amongst that glow, but I never got close enough to see for sure. I meant no offence, great guardian, of these woods, Michaela stammered. These men insisted, and they come seeking information. Do they? The great beast asked. His head shifted to focus on Michaela, eyes burning into her. She knelt to bow, keeping her head low until it seemed satisfied. And then its attention turned to us. And what information is it that you seek? The ritual forbidden by Charles, Starkman said. The one that draws power from it, how is it performed? You tamper with a force that is far beyond you, human. The old fay hissed. You would not be wise to deal with the destroyer. We're not the ones dealing with her, Cooper said. But there's a lady out there who is, and if we don't stop her, I'm willing to bet what she'll do I ain't gonna be any better for you than it is for us. And there was a low, deep rumble that shook the earth beneath us. And laughter. <laughs> we are beyond your world, human. Beyond your petty struggles. The doomed effort of Apoyothis, of one human, is of no concern to us. If Charles discovers her, her fate is already sealed. You waste your time. Leave this place. The old fate turned as if it was about to return to the water, but I called out to it. This isn't just some woman. We've seen things she's done. She's already drawn some power out of Charles. God only knows what else she's capable of. What a beast. We stopped and we silent for a moment. You speak of Primrose Kennard. It said after a few moments. I do. And the creature huffed before fixing its eyes on me. Ill tidings, indeed. There is a chance Shal may destroy her, but Kenneth's dealings go deeper than most humans. If you are so committed to learning the ritual, I will tell you what you need to know. But a price must be paid. And what price might that be? I asked. Information. This precious requires something precious in return. I see you, Roy Wilson. I see what you hold dear. You may have what you seek, but only in return for what you hold so close to your heart. Her eyes burned into mine, and in them I could see Sarah's face. I could see Jack. I opened my mouth, ready to say no, but the words, they caught in my throat. And with just one simple word, I was about to lose everything that ever mattered to me. In exchange for what? Stopping some old mad witch? Could I really say it? And what about what's close to my heart? A voice said, still in the old phase of tension, before I could give my answer. And the creature looked over, fixing his eyes upon Marshall Cooper. Would that be enough for you? He asked. Harrison Cooper. How interesting. You would give up what you held most dear to me? All for one shot at Primrose Kennard. 
I would, Cooper said. Now do what you've got to do and tell us what we need to know. And the great creature chuckled again, eyes remaining fixed on Cooper. <laughs> Very well then. Our contract is sealed. It said and I could hear a cold glee in its voice. Now, the apotheosis ritual. It cannot be performed inside the mortal realm. No. To draw such power from Shal, one must gain access into the abyss. Shal's realm. Gatina will not be easy. Its temples are spread thin. Yet one exists close by, buried under rock and time in the Chisos. Cannot is there now and grows ever closer to her prize. Through the temple, she shall enter the abyss. Once she is inside, she will grow more powerful by the moment. I know of no way to stop this beyond drawing the attention of Shal, which is most unwise. Should Shal find you, even I could not say what they will do. Yet I know your fates would make death seem envious. You must destroy Kennard or the temple before she enters the abyss. And after that, it will be too late. So, the Chisos Mountains, Cooper said. That's where she is. Move quickly. She will reach the temple soon. Then, it is in the hands of fate. The beast said as it turned to descend back into the pond. We watched as it vanished beneath the surface of the water, leaving it still and tranquil once again. And Cooper's breathing sounded heavier than usual. He looked unsteady on his feet and I ran to his side to grab him before he collapsed. We got what we came for, Starkman said. We should move, now. Give him a minute, I said. Marshal, what the hell did you give that thing? The only thing I ever cared about, he replied. There was a new wheeze in his breath and I could have sworn that his skin looked white as a sheet. It's all about the chase, Roy. It's always been about the chase. He steadied himself on his feet. Don't think too much on it. We all make our last ride eventually. And if we're lucky, we go out in a blaze of glory. Michaela, take us back to town. We'll need to pick up some supplies. I'd say I still got one last ride left in me, and I'm going to make it count. And smiling that same boyish smile he always wore, Harrison Cooper started back towards the woods. Even Michaela shrank back a step from him, watching him as he started back the way we'd come. The trip back out of the woods went even faster than the trip in, but that ride back into Del Rio felt like it took ages. Cooper almost looked as if he had aged 50 years. He didn't need to say a word for me to know that he was suffering. Tomorrow morning, we ride for the Chisos Mountains to finish this for good. And I know it'll be Cooper's last. Hell, it might be the last for all of us. The Last Ride of Roy Wilson The Finale Let's get straight into that. Our last day in Del Rio had spent gathering supplies, bullets and rations for our last ride out. I couldn't say just how much good it might do us, but it was all we could do to prepare. As soon as we had made it back to town with Henry and Michaela, Cooper looked down near ready to collapse. And Starkman and I had needed to help the man off his horse once we made it to the inn. You look like death warmed over, Marshal, the doc had said. You should stay here. Let us handle Kennard and Jones. 
I'll let you have all the fun? Cooper asked, still wearing that damn smile. The hell I will. We'll leave in the morning and finish this right. And I could tell Starkman didn't approve, but he knew as well as I did that Cooper's mind always made up. His attention shifted over to Henry, who'd lingered like a whipped dog behind us. And you, kid, you get on out of here. At the sound of Marshall's voice, the boy perked up a bit. What? Ah, you heard me. Put Del Rio behind you, boy. And don't you ever look back. Y you mean that, Marshall? Cooper, what the hell are you doing? Starkman asked. Just hush up, Doc. Go on, Henry. He gave the boy a nod and I swear I saw the kid's eyes light right up. Sh sure thing, Marshal. Thank you. The way he ran from us told me he'd likely been waiting for a chance to do so for a while. Michaela watched him as he ran, scoffing at the sight of it. You out of your damn mind, Marshal? Starkman snapped. He's going to go straight for Kenneth and Jones. No, he ain't. Cooper replied. He knows damn well they're likely to kill him, if he does. Just let it be, Doc. And Starkman grimaced and looked over to see Henry on the street. Glancing back at us to make sure we weren't giving chase, he spat in the dirt and shook his head. And Cooper's attention shifted to Michaela next. Ah, we could likely use someone who knows a thing or two about the unnatural. I don't suppose you mind a trip to the mountains. As a matter of fact, I would, she replied. Much as I might not mind watching you kneel over and ride over, just the smell of you tells me your blood's no good anymore and the rest of you. And she exhaled a dry laugh. <sighs> well, I won't lie to you about your chest, but I do wish you well. Besides, my kind prefers to stay by the water. It's far too dry out where you're headed. That's so. Cooper asked. Well, for what it's worth, thank you for all you've done for us. I'd say I hope we meet again under better circumstances, but, well. Taking it in your stride, huh, cowboy? She asked. I suppose I can't blame you. Too many of you dime book cowboy type die to happenstance or misfortune. Shot in the back of the head just like Jesse James, without ever knowing their day had come. I'd choose the same as you if it were up to me. Better to have one last fight with your head high and go out in a blaze of glory. And I hope it's everything you wanted, Marshal. And Cooper just smiled at her and tipped his hat one last time. Michaela did the same before she turned her horse and rode back towards the waterfront. And just like that, it was just the three of us again, staring down something so big we didn't know if we could take it. And knowing we were going to do so anyway. June 20th, 1887. We left El Rio at dawn, right in due west to the Chisos. We crossed the border, cutting through Mexico to save time. Cooper was hardly in any condition to ride the day and a half it would have taken to make it there, and we were fixing to waste as little time as possible. It was late afternoon when we saw the mountains looming before us, and dusk had started to set in as we drew nearer. The sun wasn't even down when we saw a plume of dust in the distance from an explosion of some sort, and Starkman paused to stare at it. You reckon that's them? he asked. Well, that thing we spoke to said they were digging. I replied. Well, if I was looking to dig something out real quick, I'd want dynamite. Stagman huffed in agreement before he kept riding. Cooper lagged at a pace behind us, dead silent and white as a ghost. He didn't complain, and with a stern yet resolute look on his face. I knew he was saving every ounce of strength he had left for the coming fight, and were I in his shoes, I might have done the same. It was another hour before we saw the dust of another explosion, all but confirming where a quarry waited. I caught Starkman cutting ahead of us, eager to get to the fight. The sky had an orange glow, as if it had been set ablaze when we reached the mountains. The sound of the last dynamite blast had been close and 
we could hear the voices of men shouting amongst themselves. We took advantage up on a high ridge to look down at where Jones and Kennard's gang were excavating. And sure enough, there was a tunnel leading deep into one of the mountains, and by our account, about eight men working in the area. I spotted a bulky figure, and I was sure it must have been Jonesy amongst them. He seemed to be speaking with a fellow I assumed to be his second, in command, before noticing a tenth figure leaving one of the tents that set up. And I recognized them as Primrose Kennard immediately. Well, looks like the gang's all here, Starkman said. So, how are we going to play this? Uh, we come at them with Kennard and Jones on the field, and we're all dead, Cooper replied. We know Jones won't die easy, and he'll go down guarding Kennard. I'll uh, be careful with how we deal with that woman too, I said. I don't think it was a stray bullet that nicked me in the back of the church. I took aim at the woman. I fired and I'm the one who got hit. She's got some sort of protection. Oh, is that it? Starkman asked before sighing. Well, shit. Did we just ride out here without a fucking plan? Duck, when you figure out how to kill a man who can shake off having his head blown to bits, you let me know. I snapped at Starkman. He was quiet for a moment, as if he was genuinely thinking on that. And down below, Kennard and Jones seemed to speak for a moment, before turning and heading for the hole in the mountain. I saw two of their gang following them in. They're heading inside, Cooper noted before readying his Winchester. The hell are you doing? I asked. That right there, son? That's a window. Plus, if that woman is going into that cave, then you can bet your ass that they are close to the temple. We're short of time. The marshal steadied his aim and fixed one of the gang members in his sights. As he did, Starkman got up and headed down the ridge. I watched him for a moment, almost calling after him before thinking better of it. Ah, well, shit. I guess we're doing this. I said under my breath, before following him down. I can't say it was much of a plan, but, hell, if it wasn't all that we had. I don't suppose you've got an idea beyond going in our guns blazing? I asked Starkman as I caught up to him. They've got dynamite down there, a lot from the looks of it. If we can get into the cave, then we can rid the cave outright and bury those sons of bitches under the mountain. He replied. Oh, that's your plan? I asked. And if it doesn't work? Then we'll kill him the old-fashioned way. As we neared the bottom of the ridge, I heard the first of Cooper's gunshots. And down in the little encampment of Jones' gang, I saw a man hit the ground hard, dead on his feet or not, that Marshall could still shoot. Starkman slid down part of the ridge and dove for cover behind a rock. I joined him. Jones' men had their eyes up on the ridge, looking for Marshall. They were sitting ducks for us. Starkman fired first. His first couple of shots caught one of the men in the chest. The poor bastard belly had time to cry out before he hit the ground. It's an ambush, one of the men cried. I set my sights on him. It was hardly a crack shot, but I got him in the leg. The four surviving members of Jones's gang scrambled for cover. Cooper's rifle fired again, striking down another of them as he tried to get to safety. And from the cave, I spotted the two men who got in with Jones and Kennard when an out to investigate. I emptied my six-gun in their direction. One of them fell back, clutching at his neck. His companion only spared him a glance before diving for cover. A bullet struck the rock I'd taken cover behind and I dug my head low to avoid another shot that might have taken my head off. Starkman abandoned our cover for a better position, and I could hear a few desperate, blind gunshots sounding off, but as far as I could tell, none of them had hit anything. Cooper's rifle sounded again, echoing through the mountains. I poked out from my cover to see one of Jonesy's boys make it a run for the tents, and I put him down before he could get there. And from the corner of my eye, I spotted another one of the gangsters getting a new window in his skull courtesy of Starkman. By my count, we now had the advantage of numbers, and those boys, <laughs> they knew it. Back in the temple, 
I heard one of them call him before Cooper's rifle silenced him. I could see the last man running from the cavern, and he had just made it through the mouth before several bullets tore through his back. I saw Starkman standing amongst the carnage, his gun in his hand, and I aimed at the mouth of the cave, his eyes burning with a fury as he reloaded his revolver. I could see Cooper heading down the ridge to join us, and reloaded as I waited for him. They didn't seem too tough, I heard a breathless Cooper say as he made it to my side. He looked damn near ready to collapse and stop beside me to catch his breath. I didn't need to remind him that they weren't the ones we'd been worried about. Starkman had headed for the tents, no doubt looking for dynamite, although his eyes kept anxiously darting towards the mouth of the cave, and I knew damn well why. In the darkness, I could see movement. Something in the shape of a man coming out of the shadows, drawn by the silence after the storm. Daniel Jones, or at least what used to be Daniel Jones, emerged from the cave. His face looked hmm, twisted, as if it were held together by stitches. It wasn't even his own face anymore. I barely recognized it as a face of the man that I stabbed a few days prior, although I had no doubt that it was Jones that it was attached to. Cooper raised his Winchester up at the man while Starkman kept his revolver trained on him. And here I hoped I might have seen the last of you, Marshal, Jones said. His voice sounded wet as if he were choking on his own mucus. Mr. Jones, you ain't gonna see the end of me until you hang for all you've done, Cooper replied. And to that, Josie just offered a crooked smile. Uh, you'll have a hard time with that, Marshal. I ain't so sure you could even hang a man like me, even if you tried. You didn't forget now, did you? I'm a little different than before, thanks to Miss Kennard. And Jonesy took a drunken step towards us, not even bothering to go for his gun. That's the reward for helping her with her apotheosis, you see. By dawn tomorrow, Marshal, there'll be a new god in this world, and I will be her divine right hand. I walk now as a lion amongst sheep, and all of you are not modern prey, made to be consumed. And before the words could leave his mouth, Cooper fired his rifle and put a bullet straight through Jonesy's new head. Dark, pulpy gore erupted from the back of it, although the man hardly seemed to notice. Nor did he notice when Starkwin emptied his pistol into his head and chest. Bits of bone and flesh were launched aside, and if the old Jonesy was laughing, it was nothing more than a distorted wheeze amongst the gunfire that downright obliterated his skull. Cooper fired another round into his chest, and still, it had no effect. Dark, the dynamite, he called, and Starkman wasted no time in heading back for the tents. Jonesy remained standing and hastily drew for his pistol. I hadn't thought he even could shoot in his current state. I can't imagine Cooper or Starkman had either. He squeezed off just one shot towards the tents. Only one, but it was enough. The explosion of dynamite knocked Cooper and myself off our feet and sent Starkman utterly flying. I hit the ground hard and lay on the ground stunned for a moment before I noticed Jonesy advancing on us. He shrugged off his heavy duster, revealing pale and rotten bare flesh beneath it. Just like that thing in the barn, he was held together by little more than stitches, and his body looked bloated and swollen. He stopped only briefly before one of his own dead men, and I watched as his belly seemed to split open like a twisted, toothless maw, and fleshy red tendrils gripped the corpse of the dead man and pulled it into him with a sickening, sucking sound. As it did, I watched the remains of Jonesy's head fall away uselessly onto the ground as a new head, and that of the man he was currently eaten rose up in its place. His eyes opened, alive with a new life, and fixated on me as that more in his stomach swallowed the dead man whole and closed up again. Hi hey there, Roy, he said his voice even more gobbled than before. 
He raised his gun at me and I moved, scrambling for cover before he fired. Come to hunt me down again, have you? I heard Jonesy tease. Well, this time ain't gonna go so well as it did when you turned traitor on Blake. No, sir. And I could hear the sound of Cooper's Winchester firing and a grunt of frustration from Jonesy. I moved from behind cover, praying to a god I might have shot, and I did. The hand that had once been Jonesy's gun was little more than a bloody stump that he clutched. His focus had shifted to Cooper, a short distance away, and he didn't notice me until it was too late. I emptied my revolver into his head, knowing it wasn't going to kill him, but not giving half a damn. And behind Cooper, I could see Starkman up on his feet, scraped up and worse for wear, but alive. Cooper fired his Winchester again, and the force of the bullet sent Jonesy back a step, and I heard him hiss at that, disgusting more in his stomach cold open again. Jesus fucking Christ! Cooper spat before shooting at the moor. It did no more good than shooting him anywhere else. And Jonesy went for his other gun, and Starkman pulled Cooper down into cover. His few shots thankfully missed, and I took the opportunity to put some distance between myself and the Colossus of flesh that used to be Jonesy. He stood still for a moment before leisurely lumbering over to the corpse of another one of his dead men. The red tendrils in his stomach's maw ensnared that corpse before beginning to pull it into him. And I knew what would happen next. Whatever was left of his old hand dropped off as the hand of the dead man he just consumed grew in its place. The damage done to his head was filled with bits from the head of the man that he was consuming. Go ahead, boys. Shoot me again. Might actually do something this time, he hissed. Y'all gonna run out of ammo eventually. I spotted Starkman gesturing to me a few feet away, and I ran to join him. Jonesy raised his pistol to take a shot at me, and just barely missed me by a hair. He just chuckled playfully before plunging a hand into that sick maw in his stomach and pulling out the gun of the man he'd just eaten. Now if you got any idea on how to kill this son of a bitch, now's the fucking time. Starkman snarled at me. Cooper leaned against the rock beside him, struggling to breathe and clutching his Winchester with a death grip. I'm thinking on that, I replied. Jonesy's eyes were fixated on our new hiding spot and I knew we didn't have long before we needed to run. And a few feet away from him, I spotted another corpse. One of the men shot down by Cooper. He had a few pale sticks of dynamite looped into his belt. Well, could you think a little harder? God damn it, Starkman said. I looked back at him. Duck, Cooper, get his attention and then blow his head off again. Well, that ain't exactly working so far, Roy, Cooper rasped. Just trust me, God damn it, go. Well, I shooed him away and Starkman swore under his breath before darting out from behind the rock. He fired a few stray rounds at Jones. Hey, you yellow son of a bitch. Yellow, Jonesy replied. His malformed head turning to follow Starkman before he fired on him. He caught Starkman in the shoulder and sent him down. A poor chase of last words, sir, he said, keeping his gun trained on him. You're sure you won't reconsider. And Starkman kept his gun on Jonesy and fired at him until his pistol clicked. Jonesy just grinned down at him, knowing it didn't matter one bit. I might if you still got ears to hear him. As soon as the words left his mouth, Cooper emerged from behind the rock. He fired twice, both bullets hitting their mark, and for the third time that day, relieving Jonesy of his head. Starkman rolled himself out of the way as Jonesy fired at the spot where he'd been before trying to aim his gun at Cooper. While he was distracted, I moved, running for the nearby corpse that I'd seen. I knew I didn't have much time before Jonesy noticed me, and I made for the most of it. Cooper emptied his Winchester into Jonesy's body before diving back to cover as Jonesy angrily fired at him. 
He let out a wet popping noise before his guns were finally trained on me. As I saw his arm move, I scurried out of the way and watched as Jonesy lumbered over to the corpse I had just been standing over. I prayed he would have noticed the hiss and the crackle of the lit dynamite. You're starting to, uh, starting to annoy me, he said through a half a mouth as that moor in his stomach opened up again. You have long since crossed the line between bravery and suicide. How much longer can we play this game? And the red tendrils gripped the corpse of the dead man and pulled him in, head first into that moor in his stomach. Bits of the new head grew to replace the ones that were lost. But as they did, I saw Jonesy's eyes widening in horror as he realized, too late, what was going on. Wait! No! Frantically, he dropped his guns and tried to grab the body as that hole in his stomach consumed it. And I could see the more wretched as if trying to spit up the corpse, but it's... I was too late. The explosion tore through Jonesy, and there wasn't a damn thing he could do to stop it. One moment he was whole, the next it was nothing but a small crater, in a cloud of dust where he stood not moments ago. I saw the top half of him, launched away and dashed violently against one of the rocks strewn around. And then all was quiet. Starkman picked himself up slowly, clutching at the wound in his shoulder before stumbling towards Cooper so he could check on him. I kept an eye on them before approaching the remains of Jonesy, hoping to God that he was truly dead. I should have known better. His eyes followed me as I approached him. He had only one arm left and a half-formed, already wounded head, and what remained of his chest was nothing but a ragged mess through which I could see his beaten heart, and it beat ever faster as I approached him. Damn you! Damn you! I heard him rasp, bitter and defiant to the end. Jalla bastard! I ain't the one dying in the dirt, Jonesy. I replied before replacing my boot over his beaten heart. His hand gripped my ankle, but he wasn't strong enough to stop me. Not anymore. When you see Blake Hayes, you tell him. You tell him I said hello. I pressed down on his heart and felt it break under my foot, and Josie's eyes went wide and twitched. His mouth opened and closed as he struggled to scream, and then he was silent. I wiped my boot off in the dirt and spat on him, before turning to check on Starkwin and Cooper. Ah, Cooper looked all right, but Starkwin looked like he'd seen better days. He put a rag over his wound and was keeping pressure on it as best he could. How bad is it? I asked. He grazed me, Starkman replied. The ears are still ringing from the dynamite though. Christ, please tell me that fucker is dead. He's dead, I replied, and watched as calm entered the doctor's eyes. Thank God. Cooper looked towards the mouth of the cave, and his eyes narrowed. We're down to just one now, he said, before setting his Winchester down. He drew his revolver and let out a tense exhale. <sighs> I don't suppose we have enough dynamite to just bury her? Jones blew it out of hell, Starkman said as he tied a bandage onto his arm. We're doing this the old-fashioned way. And Cooper nodded slowly. Lynn, let's get to it, then. I helped Starkman to his feet as Cooper started towards the mouth of the cave, and we followed him. Oil lamps led our path deep into the bowels of the mountain. That heavy silence was back. There wasn't a soul alive in there save for us, and perhaps Kennard herself. I can't recall just how far we went or how deep the path into the mountain ran. We could have been walking for hours or even days. Those moments just blended together, like a surreal dream. It wasn't until we heard the sound of running water drawing ever closer that we knew we were at our destination. The tunnel opened into a darkened chamber, lit by torchlight. Water cascaded down convex stone walls, coming up from a pitch-black source just above us. 
A small pathway leading over a gently flowing river led us to the centre of the chamber, and in its centre was Primrose Kennard. She wore an ornate red dress that flowed around her, and she danced with a fervour that seemed inhuman. And there was a violence in every single one of her motions as she moved. She hadn't seemed to notice us, not yet at least, but Starkman was quick to change that. Kennard! He snarled, and at that sound of his voice, she stopped. She turned, fixing us with a furious glare, as she watched us draw nearer to her. And Starkman kept his gun on her, as if it posed any real threat to her. You've taken a lot from me. I'd very much like to return the favor, he said. What a selfish notion. In the face of something far greater than yourself, she replied. Vladimir Starkman, isn't it? Igor's brother. Don't you dare say his name, Starkman growled as he spoke. Her lips curled into a grin. You really think that you're going to exact some sort of revenge upon me? Is that it? You imagined you'd chase me down, interrupt my apotheosis, and... What? Kill me? Bring me back to San Antonio and hang me? Her eyes darted between myself and Cooper. Ah, that was the idea, Cooper said. But after all the trouble we've been through, I'm content to leave your corpse to rot down here. By all means, Marshal, shoot me, she said for a moment. I was sure that Cooper was going to try. Instead, he took a step to water. If I thought that might end well, I would, he said. Primrose Kennard, I am placing you under arrest for the murder of John Str- as he advanced on her, Kennard's eyes seemed to flash. The ground beneath us shook as the darkness above her seemed to come alive. A great droning filled my ears. Like heaven's trumpet sounding, and in the void behind her, I saw a great red glow from behind the shimmering water. Arrest! Kennard laughed, her voice echoing through the chamber, just as loud as the droning. How quaint! You'll not stop my apotheosis. Gentlemen, but since you've come so far, I will allow you to witness it. And through the flowing water behind her, I could see a great red cross in the sky. Shall. Kenneth twirled, resuming her frantic dance as I fell to my knees. And beside me, I could see Starkman clutching his head and screaming as Cooper looked up into the great visage of Shal. I couldn't will myself to move. The great cross from the abyss held sway over me. I couldn't even look away. And Kennard's violent movements seemed to blur together as they did. I saw a pair of great stone doors slide open on the far side of the dome chamber. And beyond them was a darkness so complete that it seemed like a void. Kennard's dance came to a close as she stared into the doors before she looked back at us. The droning grew louder louder, and as I looked into that darkness, I knew that Charles awaited beyond it. Come, I heard Kenneth say, witness the ascent of your new god. And grinning from ear to ear, she strode confidently through the doors and into that darkness that swallowed her whole. The droning of Charles did not fade, nor did it weaken. I don't know how I found the strength to stand, but somehow I did. Cooper, I called, my voice barely breaking past the noise. Starkman, come on. And Starkman was on his hands and knees, blood dribbling from his ears. At the sound of his name, he looked up, seemingly disorientated before he finally stood. And Cooper was the last of us to rise, and he looked into that darkness, and with a fear I understood all too well. And then he stepped forwards, towards it, and together we entered the abyss. The first thing I noticed was silence. The droning was gone. The sky above us was a hazy pink and yet it seemed wrong. Unnatural somehow. It took me a few moments to recognize the space we stood in. It looked different on the other side. We'd come out in the same chamber we entered through. Only this one looked as if it had been blown to pieces. The mountain that had been on top of us was gone, giving us a clear view of the sky. 
and I could see bits of rock floating lazily through the air as if gravity had no effect on them. Stagwan blinked in disbelief as he surveyed the area around us before noticing Kenneth a few feet away and she stared up at the pink sky, still smiling wide. You should be on it, she said without looking back at us. Only a few have ever set foot in the abyss while still alive. It's beautiful, isn't it? And Cooper raised his revolver and aimed it at her back, and she didn't even acknowledge him. Whatever you're doing, it stops now, he said, his voice barely a wheeze. It's far too late to stop this, Marshal, Kenneth said, but I will be a merciful god. Put down your gun and... I might even be so kind as to give you back your life. I can hear it in your voice, see it in your face. You made a deal with the old Fae, didn't you? Gave up your life. Just for a shot at me? What a waste. But soon, once I have the power of Shal, I can undo it. The old Fae may be powerful, but I will be even greater than them. And she turned to face us at last her eyes bright. Put down your gun, Marshal. There's a new world coming. Embrace it. And Cooper just kept his pistol aimed at her. His eyes met hers and he excelled before he pulled the trigger. He fired three shots before he collapsed backwards with three stains of blood growing on his chest. And Kenneth watched him fall with an indifference. So be it then, she said. Your choice is made. And with that, she turned back to look up at the pink sky and raised her hands. A crimson bolt of lightning came down from the heavens and connected with her palm. And Kenneth let out a cry of pain. Her knees seemed to give out and she nearly collapsed. But she kept her hand outstretched. Her apotheosis had begun. No, Starkman cried. He ran for her, probably trying to tackle her. To stop her somehow, but another bolt of crimson lightning struck the ground in front of him and lodged him back a step. Kenneth rose to her feet, swaying drunkenly as the crimson power flowed through her, and she looked back at Starkman. Her vicious grin returned. And you, you wanted revenge, she crooned. Her voice had gained a hint of an echo. I think I'll destroy you first and she advanced on him as he lay in a heap on the ground before a single final gunshot rang out through the abyss. Blood erupted from Kenneth's head, crackling with electricity. Her eyes were wide and shocked. I looked back towards Cooper, who lay dead on the ground beside me, and blood found out behind his head. His revolver lay under his jaw and that boyish smile had lingered on his face. The sky went dark for a moment, before lighting back up again, seemingly brighter than before. And Kenneth swayed uneasily on her feet, not dead, but for the time, wounded. She pressed a hand to her head and I took the window that I could. I couldn't shoot her, and I sure as hell wasn't about to shoot myself, but maybe I could find another way to hurt her. I pulled her away from Starkman and threw her to the ground. Kenneth rolled against the stone floor before picking herself up, her lips curled back into an animalistic snarl. You struggle in vain, she barked as I closed in on her. I hit her jaw and felt the force of my own blow against my face. Another bolt of crimson lightning struck beside me, blowing apart the ground underneath my feet and sending me flying. You have nothing, she cried. No means to stop this. Your best efforts are too little and too late. And I saw Starkman try to stand, only for another bolt of crimson lightning to strike between us, lodging us both again. Starkman rolled slowly on the ground before starting to pick himself up. Not exactly, he rasped, glaring up at Kennard as he made it to his knees, and she towered over him raw electricity sparking across her body, her brow furrowed in confusion. That power you got, it ain't yours, is it? Now I don't know a hell of a lot about gods or robberies, lady, but I know that if you're stealing anything from anyone, 
you might want to be a little bit quieter. For a moment, the sky above us went dark, and it took me a moment to pick up on what Starkwin had already figured out. And looking up, I realized that the unnatural sky above us, it wasn't a sky. The sky, it doesn't blink. Kenneth looked up, her eyes growing wide as the sky pulled backwards, shrinking further and further back to reveal the rest of the massive, dark thing that had been watching us. I couldn't pick out its true shape from the darkness of the void behind it, but its countless pink eyes looked like stars in the sky. No, Kenneth said, her voice little more than a frightened whisper. No, 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 please. She shrank backwards towards the great doors that had led us into that cursed world, but she could have moved fast enough. Starkman wore a wry smile as he watched her, although his smile quickly faded as dark tendrils crept over the land around us. Kenneth froze dead in her tracks, dumbstruck as she looked up at them. No matter at her fate, I was sealed. That lone drone sounded once more from the darkened sky as a great red cross appeared in it and shall, in all of its great and terrible glory. Kenneth looked into the horizon, into that terrible cross, and she opened her mouth as if she were about to beg, but she never got the chance. One of the dark tendrils shot down towards her and forced itself into her mouth, and tears streamed from her eyes as it pushed its way down her throat. I saw her body going stiff as she tried to fight it, before her limbs slowly began to slacken. The tendril kept moving down her throat like a great endless snake. Her skin grew paler and paler until it was almost as white as snow. Even her hair seemed to fade to white. And Starkman looked at her, watching as the tendril slid quickly down into her body before finally seeming to disappear. And at last, Kenneth fell to her knees, struggling to breathe and retching as she were about to vomit. Her arms trembled, her eyes seemed to glow an ominous red, and then, at last, she spat up something pale and milky white. It seemed to sizzle and burn on the ground before it evaporated, and at last, all was silent. It was a few moments before we heard Kenner begin to laugh, and Starkman slowly picked himself up, his pistol in hand, and placed it to her head and teeth gritted in rage. And Kenneth barely even looked up at him. She instead looked down at her own hands, flexing her fingers and turning her wrists. No, no, why won't you fucking die? Stockman hissed. At last, Kenneth looked up at him, her eyes pitch black and with blood red irises. Stockman's gun dissolved inside his hand, fading away into dust that slipped through his fingers. And I felt my own gun doing the same. When he stumbled back a step, eyes focused on Kenneth as she rose to her feet. It's a shame she had such promise. But I suppose I may have been too lenient. Well, it hardly matters. She got her wish, I suppose. She? Starkman asked. Don't be dense, gentlemen. I think you're both far beyond that. Kennard brushed off her dress before looking over at me. You're... you're not Kennard, I said slowly. Are you? Primrose Kennard longed for the power of a god. I simply gave her what she wanted. But unfortunately, there isn't room for her and I together. I suppose it might be fun to manifest for a while. It's been some time since I bothered, but let's not linger. The abyss is such a dull place, sometimes, and I'd very much like to go a walk. And with that, Kennard, or what I suppose used to be Primrose Kennard, turned and made her way to the great doors on the wall. Starkman watched her for a moment before moving to follow her. I knelt down beside Cooper and picked up his body to carry it back. The temple on the other side of the abyss was quieter than it had been before when we returned and Kennard looked around as if she had never seen it before. You shall? Starkman asked warily. 
and kept his distance from the woman as if she was a viper ready to bite him. I've been called many names by many iterations of this universe. But if that's what you care to call me, then by all means, she said, and Starkman eyed her mistrustfully. If you're the god of destruction, what are you here for? I asked. To end the world? In due time, but not right now, Xiao replied. No, as I said, right now I'm here for a walk. There's so much to see, so much to take in. I like to savor my food, know what it is that I'm consuming before I consume it. A few centuries outside the abyss, and then we'll see. Her eyes fixated on Starkman, and then on me. Perhaps you might join me. I wouldn't mind some company. And Starkman was silent for a moment. He glanced at me, and then back at Shaw. My brother, he finally said. Could you undo what Kenneth did to him? Talon, I could show you how to do it yourself, and then some. Her lips curled into a knowing grin. What do you say? And Starkman, he didn't answer at first, and it was a few moments before he took a step forward to take a place at Charles' side. He looked back at me, her eyes meeting for the last time. I didn't know what to say to him, if I should stop him or go with him instead. And so instead, I just stared back at him. You take care of yourself, Roy, he finally said, before nodding and heading for the tunnel. And Shao let him lead, and looked back at me with a wry smile on her face. And then, just like that, she was gone too. I stayed in that chamber with Cooper's body before I carried him outside. Starkman, Hanged, and Kenneth were long gone, and when I got there, I doubted I'd ever see them again, for better or for worse. I have taken the time to bury Marshall Cooper and to close the tunnel leading into the mountains. I am tired. There are horses that I can take and supplies to bring with me. Part of me longs to go home, but after the things I have seen, I am not so sure I'll ever be quite the same man I was before. I think I will bury this journal with a marshal and set out for the wilderness. If I make it back to the Guadalupe Mountains, I will find Sarah and Jack and I will leave Texas behind and never look back. I am not sure if what we now let into this world is something that should be here or not. Even if it isn't, I know there's not a damn thing I could do to stop it anyway. Either way, what's done is done, and the road calls to me. I do not know what lies in wait, and perhaps that is a mercy. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. Absolutely chest pounding and riveting storyline once again from the incredibly talented Head of Spectre over on Reddit. Guys and girls, if you're looking to keep yourself occupied during a dull day, why not head over to Head of Spectre's Reddit page, smash an upvote and smash a follow. You can certainly lose yourself for a number of hours with the amount of content available. As ever had an absolute pleasure working with you. I really do hope you enjoy my rendition. And I cannot wait to uh, see you start publishing your work elsewhere. Guys and girls, you know the drill. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. If you're an aspiring writer, or just fancy having a crack at things, why not get in touch with myself at the usual email as on screen, which is dmtforestofear at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. I hope everybody's well this week, and 
having a great time at school or work, getting fully stuck in and pushing for greatness. But above all guys, remember, be safe, not sorry.